Thank you, thank you, Shah. Our friends and colleagues, it's indeed my privilege uh, to welcome you all at the 63rd webinar of the series on Rethinking Cities. This one is titled Architecture in Transition, New Findings from the Sciences. It's a very special event. And the reason it is very special is that a six person distinguished panel of alternative thinkers and practitioners we have, it's a very special privilege that we have them today. And that makes it a very special event. But before I hand this over to Dr. Nikos uh, Salingaros to conduct this session and introduce him briefly, let me tell you a bit about this webinar series. Habitat Forum, which is in half, and its many partners, local and international, are hosting this webinar series on the theme, Rethinking City, especially Rethinking the Indian City. And we are doing this since June last year. In our 60 webinars, over 350 experts, specialists, planners, economists, development thinkers, young professionals, and community groups have shared their concerns, their ideas, and their perspectives on a number of urban issues and themes. Let me also tell you why we are doing this. What is the purpose? And what is sought to be achieved by doing this webinar series now for 15 months. This series is an integral part and feeds into an initiative in half and partners have launched last year titled City URI, Citizen Urban Initiative. It's a multi-level and multidisciplinary societal effort to work on a blueprint that outlines the country's response to the complex urban challenge. It's a three-part task. A, reassessing India's urban challenge. B, rethinking Indian city. And C, reform, reformulating response in the context of the national development challenges not only urban challenges. This is in response to a recognition that our cities are not in good health and India's urban systems are faltering in many respects, be that environment or governance or finance or planning or equitable growth or sustainable development. The cities as they are, as they grow and develop, seem to convey that things are not what they should be and need an urgent re -see, rethink, and react in policy, programs, institutions, and investment. There is an unspoken silent emergency and the missing urgency and creativity in response is causing harm in economic, environmental, and human terms. With the COVID pandemic opening many fault lines in our economy, societies, and ways of living, and the climate change knocking on the door, both the short-term problem solving and long-term planning must reckon with the needs for a major change in how we see, plan, and develop our cities. With the cities contributing nearly 65% of the national GDP already, and the urban population growth estimates suggesting 870 million people in the cities by 2050, in just 30 more years, India could ill afford underperformance in addressing the complex urban challenge. The stakes are really high, be that quality of living environment 
of millions of people or the national dream of five trillion dollar economy. With all this, cities need to be rethought and reorganized. This is not to say that Pradhan Mantri Avas Yojana or Smart Cities Program or Amrit and the Toilet Mission do not matter or have not helped. They have. The point is that the response to the challenge needs much more than what is on in offer, a paradigm shift in mindset and thinking out of box in search for better and more appropriate solutions. These webinars are meant to open much needed societal dialogue on how we handle urbanization processes and develop cities so that they remain engines of economic growth minus the exploitative instinct and damaging trains such as natural resource depletion and carbon footprint. The goal is to aim for and work towards economically productive, socially just, politically participatory, environmentally sustainable, culturally vibrant, technologically adaptive, and people-centric cities. It is a demanding challenge and a daunting task, especially as our energy and resources are limited. We as individuals, organizations, and institutions tend to do what we know to do and what is doable. Time also comes when we must do what is required to be done. And we believe the urban challenge falls into the later category. That is the dominant message of this webinar series, rethinking our cities. Before handing this over to the moderator, Dr. Nico Salingaros, let me introduce him briefly because there may not be opportunity to do so. Dr. Nico Salingaros is a professor of mathematics and architecture at the University of Texas at San Antonio, San Antonio. An internationally recognized architectural theorist and urbanist, he collaborated with the visionary architect Christopher Alexander in editing the four volume, The Nature of Order. The author of several books and many research articles on architecture and urbanism, Salingaros won the 2019 Stockholm Cultural Award for Architecture and shared the 2018 Glam Divine Traditional Building Award with Michael Murphy. Over to you, Salingaros. Thank you very much. And this is all yours now. Thank you. Thank you, Kirtisha, for inviting us to uh, form this little panel and present. Namaste, everyone in India. It's a real pleasure to be um, bringing our message over uh, to India. Um, I, will, um, be, uh, uh, I will not be introducing everyone, but for the, uh, for the audience, please, I'm going to tell you the order in which our distinguished speakers will present. I will present now and then following me, Philip Royce will present, and then Anne Sussman, and then Nir Buras, and then Katie Ryan Balagdas, then Alexandros Lavdas, and then Prem Chandavarkar. Following that, we will have a discussion and question and answer session open. Uh, during all the talks, uh, please, the audience, you can write uh, in the question and answer uh, session and then uh, those uh, questions or, uh, will be read during the uh, Q&A discussion after and we will uh, answer those and discuss as, as, as far as we have time. So uh, before I begin, I just want to let everyone know that this panel does not represent the deans of the most prestigious architectural schools in the world. We are developing a new architecture and urban planning on the margins of the architecture industrial complex. This is where the real change is coming from. 
that's why Kirti Shah invited us because uh, many people are, are not aware of what's going on. It's not going on in the center, in the limelight, in the glossy magazines. It's going on in the margins and it's a revolutionary way of thinking about architecture. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to uh, try to go through my uh, talk. And um, just some um, uh, new findings from the sciences. Uh, this is a call for radical reform in the practice and teaching of architecture and urbanism. Nothing less. Uh, let me begin by something uh, surprising. What happened to beauty? Well, architecture used to define uh, beauty. Uh, but today the beauty, the word beauty has been corrupted. And uh, many people uh, claim that beautiful things are those that induce anxiety, which is a total reversal of, of uh, our revolutionary understanding of beauty. So I want to go back, instead all of us on this panel, want to go back to understanding beauty according to its healing effect on our body. It's not a question of aesthetics. The new architecture and the urbanism that we propose has to do with human health and the health of hundreds of millions of people. It has nothing to do with aesthetics. Um, when one would say, well, okay, beauty is something is aesthetic. Well, again, it's not aesthetic, uh, but um, uh, the, the frightening truth is that um, the uh, sustainability, true sustainability really comes from adaptable geometries that, that link to this biological kind of beauty. Uh, whereas uh, most architecture schools today uh, teach tools that are the opposite. They create uh, the opposite of a healing environment. And we can demonstrate that that kind of environment is unsustainable. It destroys life and nature, and therefore that's unsustainable. So everything here is, is linked. Here is a brief uh, list of, uh, of the design tools for living structure. We have eye tracking. And that reveals subliminal reality. Uh, fractals, a mathematical concept that is very important in design. Biophilia is the love of life and living structure. We have uh, compound symmetries and ornament, which is another mathematical um, uh, topic. And then neuro design supports human health. And then uh, going back to design patterns, that were developed by Christopher Alexander more than uh, uh, 25 years ago that documented solutions that have been ignored by the um, architectural establishment. Now, I, uh, before I forget, uh, any student who is listening right now, uh, there is a course uh, on, um, uh, on this material that I developed and uh, Architectures, which is uh, based in Delhi, has is an online site, has notes, texts, and videos online for a free self-paced course. And uh, Architectures is, is uh, helping to create a new, um, um, a, a, um, uh, a, a certified course that several universities in India uh, will be taking very soon, will be taking for credit. So uh, this material is, is mostly totally unknown um, uh, to um, architectural educators. So this is available for free. It was developed in the United States and is now available um, for anyone in, in India, uh, all over the world, really. Uh, India is in a especially good position because uh, it, um, you are an English speaking country. So you have access to all this material uh, very nicely. So uh, let me touch topic one we react neurologically to our environment, which is unconsciously. So forget all the architectural theories. The body reacts in the way it is evolved to react. And uh, we now have a nice tool for engagement. Uh, and that is the visual attention software. We can scan uh, an image uh, of, a, of, a, of a building that's built or before it is built, and we can see how we're going to react to it in the first uh, few seconds, the first three seconds. So for example, a, a minimalist building is invisible to us. We fail to engage with the minimalist building, make a big note of that. There are hundreds of millions of minimalist buildings all around the world. Look where the eye looks. The eye looks at the corners and outside the building. We fail to engage with it. It doesn't exist for us. 
Okay, how about uh, not minimalist, but uh, sort of monotonous with monotonous repetition. That's not better. The eye is not drawn to the interior of the building, it's blank. And the eye is drawn to hot spots uh, where, uh, uh, where you have the edges and the corners. Okay, how about old fashioned buildings that are, are the banned today by architectural culture? Look, those draw the eye. That's how we connect to the environment. That's how we connect to buildings to get satisfaction, to get a, a adrenaline, to feel, uh, to feel healthy. And old fashioned, more old fashioned buildings. You see the interior of the building draws attention and we can connect to it. So that's engagement. This is true engagement for the building. So why build huge structures that we cannot even see? Uh, it is just a, a misunderstanding that has continued for decades and decades. Um, it is only the, the, the mathematics um, of organized complexity that engages us and, and uh, contributes to our health. And now some notes on fractals. What is a fractal? Well, if you define something on a single scale, it's not a fractal. Fractals have a subdivision of sizes. So for example, a natural type of fractal, you see that uh, you get smaller and smaller and smaller structures. And um, uh, we can uh, put together a fractal by, uh, by um, using similar uh, objects, which means that they're the same and magnified. And uh, we, there are many of them. If they're smaller, there are many more of them. And we put them together in a, a coherent manner. And we also can add things that are, uh, that are not exactly the same, and we have a statistical fractal. You see here, I have something that's uh, architectural, that's magnified, and I can keep magnifying it, and I get structure. This is the, entirely the opposite of what most people have been doing in awarding prizes for the last century. So um, uh, uh, contemporary materials lack fractal qualities, and this is deliberate, but uh, we have shown that this is really uh, goes against our biology. So, um, uh, to, to complete the picture, then we can look at biophilia and we have the biophilic healing index. And to the fractals, we add color, curves, details, and representations of nature and orga organized complexity. And this is to be found uh, in all um, uh, more traditional architectures, which again, I emphasize have been banned by, by, um, by architectural culture. Now, in a series of papers that have just been published, we show that human and animal intelligence depends upon uh, biophilia and ornament. Because the, the, <clears throat> the octopus creates an ornamented garden. And that's the Beatles song, if you remember the Beatles song from the 60s, the octopus's garden. And um, <clears throat> human babies, <clears throat> create their intelligence. The brain grows by looking at um, biophilic environments. So this, this has to do with the intelligence quotient of the human race, the, the environment in which we are raised in. Here is a summary of some symmetries that we need in order to get this, um, this uh, high content, some symmetries. So our revolution makes us crave to see these symmetries. And what does it all add up to? It adds to restorative environments, namely healing environments, places that we can be in either inside our homes or outside our homes, if they're designed correctly, and they used to be designed correctly for millennia in the past, up until the 20th century, if we just sit or stand there, we have a healing effect and it, it helps our uh, biology. So here is a picture of the Taj Mahal. Originally be before, the, the, before the alien invaders came in and uh, sometime in the 20th century all these trees were cut down. Well we can show that the biophilic healing index was reduced by cutting down the trees. Why do people cut down the trees? because the industrial establishment hates trees. Yeah, but if you cut down the trees, then you destroy nature and you raise the temperature. That's the problem with Delhi today. 
cutting down all the trees. So we have many more tools uh, like Alexandrian patterns where uh, what I'm talking about was documented and intuited uh, by Christopher Alexander uh, already 25 years ago and uh, presented in the pattern language, a series of two books. And we have a new book with Michael Mahaffey, uh, the new pattern language. So there are two collections of patterns that help uh, those architects who want to create uh, these engaging environments. So we connect, you see, we connect to the detail which has been eliminated of the, uh, from, uh, from architecture. And uh, that's it. So um, the future of architecture in cities really lies in um, applying medical evidence, uh, getting rid of all these cult images that uh, have created inhumane architecture, but have helped uh, rapacious real estate developers to destroy uh, very humane scale cities in order to build uh, monstrous uh, buildings that create a lot of profit from them. But uh, if we want to survive, then humanity has to uh, really uh, rebuild uh, human scale cities. Okay, I will stop here. And uh, now I would like to ask um, Philip Royes to join us from Perth, Australia. Philip, please. Can you, can you hear me, Philip? Yes, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Nikos. Um, let me share my screen. Can you all see that screen? No. No. You need to oh. share. Oh. Uh, no, not yet. Okay. Yeah, now we can see now. Okay. Oh, great. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Um, it's an absolutely privilege to um, join this panel and. Um, Thank you for that um, interesting discussion, Nikos. Um, and you were mentioning the patterns that developed from Alexander, all the great work that you're doing, Mahaffey. And what I'm doing is here, like the, what was the old saying? I think it's um, Einstein that said, I'm standing on the shoulder of giants. And I'm definitely um, standing here on the shoulder of giants because of all the great work that's been done. And Taking this a bit to the next level where we look at um, a new pattern language where for sustainable development, we need to go beyond that. And this is a regenerative adaptive pattern language. Um, and this, this short talk is based on the book that I recent, recently released by Springer um, that address um, quite a few issues. But you can imagine if we look at the global scale and we need to look at um, sustainable development where it really makes sense is not based on the old uh, or the standard practice. There's lots of complexities to deal with. But first um, of all, I want to um, just acknowledge our traditional owners um, I've got a problem here with my screen. There we go. Our traditional owners, I just want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands and the waters that all of us work and, and live on, especially across Australia and the rest of the world. Um, and I just want to respect also the elders of past and present. I also want to recognize that indigenous peoples that have made and will continue to make extraordinary um, contributions to all aspects of life on this planet, including culture, economy, and science. And then also to the Wadarong, uh, thank you for sharing this country and this beautiful land that I'm actually worked on and, and love. And um, I started with this because it's very important as part of our thinking as architects and planners, um, we need to go back and, and identify with the knowledges that's, um, that's with us for thousands of years, maybe over 60,000 of years on how we need to live with the patterns and deal with the patterns of the land. Well, 
you were talking about beauty earlier. So what is beauty? What is the concept of beauty? I want you to look at this picture. This is real beauty. It is our planet. It's a living planet. This planet is made up of living structure. And this is important to understand that. It is a, it's, a, it's the only planet that we've got that's got life on it. But according to the Gaia theory, it also it, it's, it regulates itself so that there's life. Now, I like to refer back to Ian McHard's words that when he paraphrased Lauren Ainsley in 1967, and he used to uh, do this when he opened his lectures with his students. Um, he said this, man in space is enabled to look upon the distant earth a celestial orb, a revolving sphere. He sees it to be green from the verdure on land, algae greening the oceans, a green celestial fruit. Looking closely at the earth, he perceives blotches, black, brown, gray, and these extend like dynamic tentacles upon the green epidermis. These blemishes he recognizes as the cities and works of man and asks, is man but a planetary disease? Indeed, as recognized in the early 1960s, now in the 21st century, this disease, I, I reckon, is really obvious. And that is our biggest global issue that we've got today. That is the rapid urbanization and decline of our rural areas. Now, what is this major problem? And why do we have this major problem? It's because of from the 20 to the 21st century, the planning and design and construction of the built environment has been unimaginably bad, reckless and unacceptable. The way we have built our cities has resulted in the degeneration of the Earth's natural systems, now eventuating into unprecedented impacts of a changing climate. We have pushed behind the planetary boundaries. And many of you will recognize these words of Alexander, where I paraphrase from it, but add this issue about this changing climate and how we push behind these planetary boundaries. But lots of you may be saying, some of the students or these um, um, institutes and, and architects and teachers that, well, we do quite good because we, we implement sustainability. Our current state of affairs is that, um, the, that we implement sustainable goals. We, 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 we know that uh, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals are adopted cities worldwide. But the question is, um, we settle just for causing minimal damage. And if we really look at sustainable, sustainable is really just only 100% less bad. And I quote from that words from Ian McDonough in 2011. So what do we need to do as architects and planners and scientists um, to need to, to move beyond sustainable? And this is where a regenerative adaptive um, um, view of the world and system come into play. So as you could see, um, if we look at sustainable, it's really in the middle here where it's really about just restoring and be sustainable. But in essence, we are still in a regenerating system. We need to move forward to a regenerative system, go beyond just restoring. And this is where regenerative thinking and regenerative adaptive thinking needs to come in. And that's the evolutionary process. Where Nichols were talking about biphilia, this is where we as humans need to participate as nature and evolve and adapt with nature. So how do we do that? That is where I proposed in my latest book that we need to adopt a regenerative adaptive pattern language. This is a dynamic pattern language that will work with all of these dynamic systems of nature. It is the this things that's invisible that we can't see. It's the things that we feel, it's the things that we know that nature use to actually continue life on earth. So how do we do this? This is a very complex thing. But that means we need to, if we want to do this, we need to change our worldview. 
This is where an integral design worldview that is proposed by um, Professor Mark Decay comes into play. It means that we need to look at our, our individual self. It's the subjective um, areas. We need to look at the objective where we address the, the it um, in an um, integral theory. And that means we look at all the systems. We need to look at the, the bigger systems um, where everything collectively comes together. And we also need to look at the cultural perspective. Because if we want to move forward, it's not just about one science or it's not just about the visual or the physical aspects. It's, a, it's, it's about a worldview where we bring all of this collective into these four quadrants. To do that, we need to uh, move forward where we think of where humans participate as nature and evolve and adapt with nature. In this context, we look at nature experiences, that is by philia. We need that nature elements, and that is by philic. Biosystems is where we look at the nature context and how these systems of the biology and the biosphere and so forth helps to continue evolution and constant life. And then on the left lower quadrant, nature meanings. And that is bioculture. It is very important that there is a meaningful reason here and why we do this. Because if our cultures don't accept that nature is important and we've got this deep connection to nature, where Christopher Alexander, we're talking about deep sustainability. Um, it is about also our, our, our um, perspective, our attitude to life, our self behaviors, and what does this culture mean? And that's where indigenous knowledges come in to understand the deeper connection um, to nature. But that connection is quite interesting. Nature's got a language. It is a language that, um, that we can't write. We can't talk it. I don't think what if we would have been able to write it, it will be thousands of pages. But nature's language is really the language of evolution, but also there's a consciousness, um, there's some intelligence there. And what is that? And this is quite interesting. What I find very fascinating, the 15 properties, fundamental properties of Alexander um, that, that you can likely refer to as the 15 fundamental properties of wholeness is absolutely in nature, that's the language of nature that can help us identify this evolutionary process and how can we maybe apply this to our built environment. To do this, we need to understand, but the other issue is, is that nature is continuously regenerating as an evolutionary process, as an upward, spi uh, upward spiral. So to identify and work with that, we need to understand how nature regenerate, but also how to adapt. And to do that, the only way I um, put my argument forward here, and obviously totally um, radical from the normal um, thinking, is that we need to look at a regenerative adaptive pattern language, where we fundamentally look at place, and place is connected to the deep network of everything. This little diagram of the process of implementing a regenerative adaptive language look like the roots and the trees, the whole network under the soil. And as we know, there's quite a huge intelligence there from the smallest my, log, my, minor molecular level right up to the biosphere. And you may argue this is, um, this is very complex and how can we do it? But if we understand the whole, the concept of wholeness, and we look at the important things in that four quadrants that I just mentioned, we, uh, this language that I'm proposing put forward 12 patterns and 12 patterns to, to bring it down from a hierarchy of scale down to the smallest level that we can think, right down to the design of our buildings and even interfere with the natural environment. I won't go into this. Um, I, I, I mentioned earlier that it will be difficult to put all of this through in 15 minutes. Um, yes, and save the world. excuse me, Philip. <laughs> yes, you need to you need to wrap up, please. <laughs> uh, 
Um, yeah, so what I'll do is I'll just go to, um, there's the four fundamental patterns here. And if I have to wrap it now, um, there's only two minutes left. I apologize that um, I couldn't go into detail. But what I'll do is I'll go, um, I'll probably will talk to this um, one qu quickly. The whole means that all living systems are part of uh, inter interconnected whole and a part of integral existence. And therefore, if we want to move beyond a damaging anthropogenic dominant nature destructive global society, we need to consider the whole and design with nature. Um, and if I can just go through these, I think I just want to come to the last one. I apologize. Um, I obviously went over my time. Um, evolutionary adaption is probably one of the important patterns that we need to consider. The earth is in a constant state of change to calibrate conditions for life through evolutionary adaptation. Therefore, what we need to do, we need to align all our human interventions and settlements in nature with the evolutionary process of a place by applying a regenerative adaptive thinking. And this is embedded in bifilia. And I think this is very important because if we ultimately want to achieve resilience and a continuous improvement, we need to go back to that understanding of our connection to nature and bifilia. So thank you. In conclusion, I like to write, just read this last one and that will bring me right up to 15 minutes. <laughs> um, it is a, a, a sentence from Alexander, but I align it with also our connection to nature. He said the following, and I paraphrase a little bit and add some information there that I think is very important for us. If we hope to bring our towns and buildings back to life, we must begin to recreate our own regenerative languages in such a way that all of us can use them with the patterns connected to nature in them so intense, so full of life again, that these languages will almost of its own accord begin to sing. Mm -hmm. To work our way toward a shared and living language once again, we must first learn how to discover patterns which are deep and capable of regenerating life deep patterns that allows nature also to sing. Thank you. Thank you, Philip, for this uh, a very enlightening and global connection. So please, if anyone is, uh, is listening, an architect in Bangalore who wants to build an office building, please <laughs> listen to Philip. What you do has a link to the universe. If you build a glass box in Bangalore, it's just nihilistic. It, it totally disconnects from what Philip said. So just keep that in mind. And now, if you thought this was revolutionary, wait until you hear Anne Sussman, who is talking from Concord, Massachusetts. Please, Anne, you're on. Oh, thank you so much, Nikos. Let me try to share my screen. Let's see if it works here. Let's see if we can go back here. Here we go. Um, it's an honor to speak with you, Nikos. Um, it's an honor to speak after the last speaker who's talking about designing with nature because that's what my talk is really about. It's using the new technologies we have to see our nature and to see really how nature made us and how wonderful and surprising it is. Um, what I'm going to show you really quickly here is eye tracking of a very famous building in Italy, Palladio's Villa Rotonda, Villa Capra. And it is a very famous building replicated thousands of times in different ways. And I wanted to eye track it. How do people actually look at it? And what this woman is doing, she's looking at an image of the building and she doesn't know this, but her eyes moved 45 times in 15 seconds. I know this because I eye tracked her with iMotion software. iMotion software is high end um, deconstructing software that teases apart human's behavior. It's software used by all the car companies and the tech companies so they can promote their products and consumption. 
Um, the big yellow dots are, are, are fixations. That's where the visual stimuli comes in. The lines are saccades. And I can actually see inside her brain and know her subliminal, her unconscious behavior better than she does. This is the world we're in today. It's kind of amazing. And what the big companies do, like Apple, Honda, BMW, GM, when they're looking at something, they'll get 30 to 39 people to look at something. And then they'll use stats, statistics, to actually show, well, where will people look for second, third, and fourth? And they, they really are into the TTFF, that's the time to first fixation. Where does the brain, usually without the person's conscious awareness, make them look first? Where does it make them look second? So here you can see with Villa Rotunda, what really attracts the people is the door and the front of the building, but they really also look at all the statues of the building without realizing it. One reason this building is so successful, people can't help but look at all the statues on the building because people are drawn to look at people. Um, this is the setup for this study that we did a few years ago. There's an eye tracker there at the, in front of the monitor um, behind, uh, the, the woman behind in the screen. And um, this is eye motion software, again, used by the major car makers. And what the big companies can also afford to do is they can track your nervous system. They track your heart rate. They use software to track your facial expressions. So they understand exactly your human experience. Um, and what you can do now too in mentioning something Nikos talked about is if you can't afford to set up a lab, you can also use software from 3M, visual attention software, which was developed about 10 years ago. And now is a plugin for major Adobe design products like Photoshop and Illustrator. And you can use that, upload any image and you'll get back a, a, a heat map if you'd like. Um, that shows you where people are going to look first in the first, you know, three to five seconds before their conscious awareness ticks in. Again, what you're starting to see is your animal nature work as you look at architecture. And what's fascinating when you do these studies is that modern architecture basically collapses. Uh, it's very difficult for the brain to look at it. It doesn't fit what the brain evolved to see the way traditional architecture does. Uh, on the left here, you have the Mass Art Building. It's a glass building, a glass box that was built um, in 2016 in the city of Boston as an art college for students in Massachusetts. And on the right is a famous uh, you know, colonial building built in the 1750s in Virginia. And when you do a quick biometric analysis with, in this case, with the 3M Bass software, you see immediately that uh, the people subliminally can immediately attach to the old building and they cannot attach at all to the new one. That has huge implications for the body and the brain. You can tell, you can do further studies to show that one building will be much more stressful for people to enter. They'll be more confused finding the front door and the other. They won't know why, but I'll know why because I've used this um, software that can tell me what their pre-attentive behaviors will be. Um, so that's one of the fascinating things when you start doing biometrics, really looking at your human nature, you see that modern architecture basically is very difficult for the brain to look at. It's not natural. And, um, you know, why? How did that happen? Um, here is again is another thing run through 3M. It's a uh, building on the left is in Cambridge, Massachusetts, near Harvard Square. The building on the right is in New, in New York. And um, it's a public library. And if you do a quick VAS analysis here, you can see the one on the left, which is now a school and covered by historic district bylaws. You couldn't even try to take this building down the one on the left. Um, the building on the left, people immediately will make a memory of it and will look right at where the door is. Whereas the building on the right, the public building, a library, they, 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 they're gonna struggle to find the door. So what happened? That was what really blew my mind. How come modern architecture almost collapses in biometric studies? And to answer that question, you really have to ask who were the founding fathers, Mies van der Rohe, Walter Gropius, Le Corbusier. And you realize when they lived, they were born very much in the same year, the 1880s. They died very in the 1960s, right? And the big deal here, which is so important to understand, is what happens when they're in their late 20s or about 30, you get World War I. 
and I cannot believe I'm giving this talk today because it is Veterans Day, November 11th in the United States, which was uh, originally founded as Armistice Day to um, honor World War I. Um, the, we're studying World War I a little bit more now, we're looking at it, um, and there was a very fascinating um, documentary about it by PBS, the American television public station, where they um, looked at how the impact of World War I is contemporary. Um, we now know 20 million deaths, um, more deaths than, were, than was originally understood. And um, it is fascinating too, uh, this, believe it or not, was painted by a Boston painter, John Singer Sargent, who was sent at the age of 62 to paint the English and American soldiers at the front in, uh, 19, in, in 1917. Um, and uh, I, th this painting did tour the United States in 2018, and I actually saw it. Gas attack, World War I. First tanks, World War I. So why are we talking about this? Because this is the amazing thing about the 21st century. We now understand how trauma impacts the brain, and a lot of this science is barely 25 years old. The ability to do magnetic resonance imaging and look inside how brain architecture changes after trauma really didn't come on until 1994. And you can see after trauma, the brain shrinks, neurons die, and the person can't help but see a different reality. Um, and that, that's huge. And that rewrites the history of modern architecture. So we now know PTSD rewires the brain um, and it causes you to see the world differently afterwards. Uh, it, a big book and probably one of the most famous books about this came out in 2014, The Body Keeps the Score by Dr. Bessel van der Kolk. And he makes it really clear about how trauma gets encoded in the body and the brain and stays and the brain and body stay in the traumatic state years afterwards. Um, we write about this in two books, Cognitive Architecture and Urban Experience and Design that came out in 2021. I'll just read this briefly. A remarkable insight from modern neuroscience is the understanding that what we express externally reflects internal brain structure or brain architecture or the structure of our hidden inner, inner world as van der Kolk says, because reality is a construct between eye and brain, not only the way we live, but specifically the way we choose to build reflects hidden internal brain design we may not know we carry, yet unconsciously are always responding to. So that new 21st, century insight, those new 21st century technologies, including eye tracking, including magnetic resonance imaging, reframe architectural history. When I now teach architectural uh, at the Boston Architecture College, I explain that Walter Gropius, the founding father hired by Harvard in the 1930s, who worked there until the 1950s, um, Gropius PTSD is in his architecture. His architecture is a direct representation of his brain disorder. And you can see that pretty easily. Um, here, um, this is his house on the left that he built when he got his job at Harvard. He built it about uh, six miles from where I'm sitting right now in Lincoln, Massachusetts, about 20 miles away from Cambridge. And on the right is a bunker uh, from the Western Front. Uh, and, and the buildings look strangely similar. Um, and when you go inside, when you look at his building next to the building next door, uh, it's very odd. The building on the left at the end of his driveway looks like a typical New England house. You can find the front door. His building, what is it? Where's the door? Um, when you visit his building, it is owned by a nonprofit now and you can visit it. Um, they tell a story about a woman going to the house and thinking it's a gas station and she wanted to know where the gas pump was. Um, so the, um, with PTSD, you lose the ability to take in detail. And that's one of the reasons modern architecture became so blank. Architecture throughout the world, um, architecture in India, architecture in Istanbul, architecture in Paris, it always had tremendous amounts of detail. People need detail to know where to look and to regulate their nervous system. Modern architecture loses detail because in part, um, it wasn't only industrial construction. What happens is with PTSD, you lose the ability to process visual detail. Uh, and what's striking about this house, what blew my mind was when you walk in, my gosh, the section of the, of the, of the office and the section of the kitchen, in fact, it, get, it, it replicates exactly the trench, the World War I trenches where you could only see um, out if you're standing up and nobody can see you from the outside. Um, it's really amazing. Um, and uh, this is Gropius's bedroom in the house he built in Lincoln, Massachusetts, 15 miles away from Cambridge. 
uh, it's amazing. He actually uh, replicated the layout of a trench. He put a corridor in the bedroom and then he built another door in the bedroom after you've already entered it. And behind that door is just the bed, exactly the experience of the trench. Um, and then the trench construction, his house mirrors trench construction. So does most modern architecture in a way. If someone's about to kill you, you're not gonna put in detail, you throw things together fast. Uh, there actually is, uh, I've been inside a World War I trench and there's a sense where vertical things get put up horizontally. It's all, it's a little bit random. And that's how Gropius's house is. On the left is the horizontal um, siding that he put places vertically. That's what you do when you're about to build a trench. Um, what about Le Cubicier? Le Cubicier, his vision was too poor to serve in the, French, the Swiss army. And here's examples of his famous buildings, which are iconic and had incredible impact. Um, but now Le Corbusier, you cannot read a biography of Le Corbusier um, since the 21st century, again, um, without realizing or the authors talking about his autism spectrum disorder. And the doctors on the left here have all corroborated it. Um, Dr. Simon Baron Cohen of uh, um, Cambridge University is an expert on autism and he talks about it as a very overly male brain, he says, and strong systems thinker. So, you know, Gro uh, um, Le Corbusier came up with his five points of architecture. He never asked anyone to, about these points of architecture. He never did any evidence-based design. He just came up with it and just did it. Um, and what's fascinating here though, that's mind blowing is when you eye track someone on the autism spectrum, you see, oh my gosh, this is pretty amazing because someone on the autism spectrum on the right is looking at the cat, their brain will not let them, their subliminal brain does not let them look at the eyes where someone neurotypical, their brain forces them to look at the eyes. That's the difference, it's, it's striking. Could we say his architectural prescriptions are ASD, autistic individuals struggle to look at faces, particularly eyes. So Corbu prescribed a free facade and ribbon windows. It's, it's basically his architecture is an expression of his autism. Now, um, there's a lot of this on the web right now uh, about how autistic brains see the world differently than neurotypical ones. Um, the one on the left is a neurotypical person looking at um, elephants. Uh, you know, one on the left is an autistic person, one on the right, a neurotypical. The neurotypical brain will make you look for an autistic uh, a look for the eye, even in um, even if it's dark, whereas the autistic person he doesn't want to look for the eye at all. And then when you take a building, what's really interesting, you did eye tracking. I had 30 people on the left um, look at this building where the windows had been photoshopped away without conscious awareness. Their brains did not let them look at the blankness. I had one individual who is autistic look at the building without conscious awareness, his brains made him look at the blankness. It's really stunning. And that's why you see the Kubisi's architecture here. You can read more about this in an article I wrote in 2017, the mental disorders that gave us modern architecture. Okay, so how did modern architecture happen? Relationally compromised people, mostly with PTSD, um, came up with the approach, abetted by a wounded world rushing to bury the past, an economic power structure willing to profit from it. They didn't look at its impact in, on people. It was not evidence-based. You can read more about this in my new book, Cognitive Architecture, the second edition, which came out in July. Um, Excuse me, and time, time. I have two more slides, I'm done. Architecture, so what's the impact of World War I? Trauma, architecture becomes avoidant. It's no longer about relationships and 21st century paradigm shift. This is um, basically, this has been presented at a medical conference. And um, this is it. The, it tells, uh, we now understanding our brain, we can see what we're built to see and what we need to see as a social species. These are all buildings um, in greater Boston, most of them protected by historic bylaws and they look like faces because they need to, that's what we need to see. And in cognitive architecture, I will say this, it's the first book in history to have 40 pictures of eye tracked architecture. And it helps you see why modern architecture and its blankness is so unnatural. And if you'd like more information, if you're interested in researching this, please do contact us. We founded a nonprofit, the Human Architecture and Planning Institute to get the word out and to encourage people to build buildings that are more in keeping with our nature. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Nikos. Thank you. I hope that was okay. 
of course that was not okay. You just you just uh, terrorized every architect and student in India because Corbusier is in the pantheon of gods. Corbusier is put next to Lord Ganesha in the temple and people worship him. Well, everyone who's listening, please listen to what Anne said. This is shocking information and she has documented in her book. So now for a little respite, we'll go to a non-revolutionary person, Dr. Nir Buras, who will bring us down to earth and talk about a very uh, non-controversial thing. Nir, please give us your talk. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Nikos. My name is Dr. Nir Burras, and I am the founder of the Classic Planning Institute. We're probably the most revolutionary among this group, and you'll uh, see that in a moment. I do have a, um, I, I, I need to, I need to uh, <clears throat> just tell you that um, I'm here uh, because of this. When I was 10 years old, I remember stepping over the man door that's inside the main gate uh, from the sandstone structure to see this. I was 10 years old and I realized it's gonna take me a long time to figure this one out. But at the end now <clears throat> that I've heard uh, Anne and I've heard uh, Professor Rose and, and, and Nikos, uh, I realized that design with nature <clears throat> pardon me, is designed for the nature of humankind. Uh, I'm also here because of this book in frustration with the planning process, at least in the United States. I, I just wrote a book here, do this. This is stuff that has always worked. So we're going to talk about human well-being that requires urban beauty and urban beauty that requires authenticity. And it's a story that starts in the 1750s. I'm gonna take it through today. Um, show you the science that sort of binds it all together, the synthesis and our conclusion. So 1750 in India saw the recent construction of Jaipur, a beautiful, wonderful town based on all the principles you can say of, um, of Indian construction, very scientific, if you know anything about it, hugely scientific and also extremely open-minded. Look at the Palladian market. This is a a, an Indian building clad in Palladian architecture built originally in the 1720s. In Europe at the same time, uh, there had been recognition that the um, that design uh, was supposed to produce a pleasing effect. And people asked at that time, is there another kind of aesthetic experience based on another principle uh, that is equally impactful? Um, well, what's the opposite of pleasure? Pain. So an aesthetic experience based on pain and terror. Yes, it could be. At least they hypothesized. Uh, and they called it the sublime. The best example of it is horror movies, where you have your entire soul, soul self engaged, the intellect, the emotions, the senses engaged in terror and pain. But they also figured it out for architecture at the time. They said that Sublime architecture, the architecture of pain and terror, would be immensely large, simple geometry, infinitely repeated, and no ornament. The library by Boulay and a um, uh, prison by Piranesi. So today we have architecture that is extremely large, simple geometry, infinitely repeated, and no ornament. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the architecture of pain and terror. We also have malignant growth of urban fabric in, in little Aarhus, Denmark. Um, we had a population uh, multiply sevenfold in the last century, uh, but the area of the city grew by 20. Don't tell me that that's efficient or, or progressive. Um, at the same time, we're seeing climate change and the, the human responses to that climate change are very, very curious. Um, I don't think the story is over. We have climate change disruptions to democracy and pandemics already. We are deep in the future and there are, there's more stuff coming down the pike if you know your futurism. So before we ask, what does the world have to teach or show India? Let's ask, what does India have to show the world? Uh, but before I answer that question, and that'll come sort of in the conclusion, um, let's uh, discuss the science that binds it all together. I've been working with uh, Nikos and Brillman and Richard Taylor uh, on what happens in your brain when you walk down the street. 
We've been talking in, in our conversation to be published soon about multiple fractals, sequence of perception, the, the brain's beauty center, all taking us to conclusions regarding design of the built environment for neuroaesthetic fit. What we do know is that the landscape of our origin has multiple fractals in it. So the clouds are fractal, mountains are fractal, rocks are fractal, trees, water, hills, plants. It's all fractal stuff and it's multiple fractals. And that these fractals are processed in the first 50 to 100 milliseconds from the onset of, uh, onset of visual stimulus. It's even before faces are recognized as faces without recognizing the person. So Nikos mentioned fractals. I, I'm just uh, illustrating this um, for, uh, for you to show you the different types of fractals out there in nature and in mathematics. But the interesting thing is that the proportions of the classical method, you've all heard of golden section. Well, that's not the whole story. As a matter of fact, it's very little of the story. There are a minimum of five proportional systems operating in any classical design of any culture. And they include here, you see the, the cyan is um, a differentiation between the larger and the smaller. That's important as large and less important as small. And you also have uh, punctuation, the tip of the leaf, the tip of the nose, the earlobe, the nail to the finger. All these things are punctuative. You also have additional proportional systems operating, but let's look at these two. They appear self-similar proportions at different scales. These are statistical fractals, just like in nature. Classical is multifractal. When the brain sees this, it is pleased. And this occurs equally in Indian architecture, Indian classical architecture. We've been building cities for 5,000 years. We have a really good idea of what to do with them. And if we do look at what we have in that beautiful basket of all the great work of humanity before we decided we needed to forget it, the classical of all cultures and periods is a holistic method of designing the built environment. And it uses traditional architectural styles that were developed for the same purposes from the same principles around the world. It's all about human experience. And that's where we spend our tourist dollars. One in seven people on the, on the planet before COVID was going around wandering as a tourist uh, uh, annually. And they went to places that have just the right fractal mix. So when we're looking at traditional architecture, how we built cities before planning ruined them, it is the same fractal dimensionalities as the African savanna, it fits the human brain perfectly. And the proof of it is some of the work that Anne has done, the, the eye tracking you see on the bottom, a modernist uh, um, design for the Eisenhower Memorial in Washington, DC. The eye has no idea where to stop. It wanders around aimlessly and actually focuses on places that are irrelevant to the design. Whereas in the traditional above here, you, the eye home homes in homes in right to the single most important spot in the in the um, composition and that is where you're going to have the inscriptions and the and the the, the carving everything that's telling you all about it so to synthesize all of this stuff really requires bringing together philosophy aesthetic experience and neuroscience and you can read about that in chapter six of the art of classic planning uh the crux of it is, and you've heard this somewhere, somehow already, there, it's about the whole notion of truth, goodness, and beauty, which the Greeks have given to us as a, an idea of holism. The classical method does use these. It, it, it works directly with these. It was translated by Vitruvius to firmitas, utilitas, venustas. In English, it is firmness, commodity, and delight, which in today's terms is durability, long-term adaptive reuse, and neuroaesthetic fit. And Prem Chanda Davarkar calls it integrity, empathy, and emancipation and transcendence. Excuse me for, for using your terminology, but I think that we're all saying the same thing. So does Alexander in many more words than, than the actual classical method needs, because the classical method is genuinely holistic. The whole idea of holism is that if you 
can measure one part, you're measuring the whole. If you're changing one part, you're changing the whole. So if we have a beauty center in the brain that lights up when you have an experience, an aesthetic experience based on pleasure, it's also telling you something about the durability and utility of something. And then you can derive a conclusion regarding the appropriateness of it in your design. It's very easy. What we see in India, the traditional architecture of India is fantastic. This is the classical method incarnate in a culture other than Western. And it's an example of it and every single culture in the world has its own classical. The amount of science, the amount of knowledge, the amount of skill, the amount of know-how, technical know-how that's in, in, embedded in this stuff is unimaginable. And to throw all this out and call it old fashioned is, you know, might as well burn up in, 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 in global warming and, and, and call it a day. So the classical method synthesizes modern science with traditional knowledge, the neuroesthetics, the biophilia meet up and are and help explain the validity and the value of Vastu Shastra, Feng Shui, Vitruvius, and all of this for human well being in the built environment, which requires beauty, and beauty, which requires authenticity. There are no shortcuts in all this. The conclusion is that the conscious language of nature in the built environment is the classical method. We've had it all along. We've chosen to forget about it for whatever reason and, and discuss some of those. And authenticity is necessary in buildings for the best human experience. So when we design a new town in Baja California, Mexico, we want it to look like it's always been there. When we are planning a, a new part of Portland, Maine, we are using the local architecture like a skin graft on a wound using um, the the, the uh, um, uh, industrial waterfront architecture, the commercial architecture, the ur urban architecture of the three levels of the town appropriately. We, we, we're not taking the gravel and the pus and sewing them back up. This is not problem solving. Problem solving it focuses on problems that were defined in the past. And it's like walking into the future backwards. What we're doing here is actually using what works to heal urban fabric. Now, because of the holism of all this, you find out that it is also seismically resilient. You have examples in Japan, have examples in Oakland, California, and you have examples in India galore of seismic resilience. You have resilient materials. I do not need to tell you anything about that. You have them all, um, uh, all right there in India. Uh, this is a uh, this is paint. This is a. Uh, um, um, uh, 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 metallic oxide paint uh, that has lasted almost 200 years is still bright and shiny. And there is pandemic resilience in traditional architecture. Look at how all the people are socially distanced. And if you look at the patterns in the architecture on the street side, you know that they inform people uh, how to distance. Th these are subliminal cues that Jan Gale goes into this whole explanation about when in fact it's built into the classical system. This is uh, Santa Maria de la Salute, one of the seven plague churches, plague redemption churches in, in, in Venice. So we need Indian tools for India. A humane alternative to the dystopia is currently projected, reflecting the magic of place and creating legacy of beautiful places, driven by community aspiration, sustained by durable construction, providing the neuroesthetic fit for the best biometrics, performance, perception, and 100-year plans that are more cost-effective than the short-term problem solving. We, we need holism that recognizes time, people, and place. So in China, you have so many of these kind of Chinese-style accretions in the new urban modernist stuff that they have going there. Uh, more than anywhere else likely in the world. Uh, but I do want to tell you that there has been a discourse uh, in, in, in recent modern times, for example, Jose uh, uh, Plechnik, Jose Plechnik in Ljubljana of the classical approach and the authentic responses to human and local well-being that are native to India are spectacular and extraordinary. And that's where the lessons for India are. 
you got to know your own stuff before you start taking it down, ignoring it, or moving on. You have so many sophisticated, unbelievably appropriate, even considering global warming, places that should be inspirational and you want to do what they do. There's even local expression in European buildings. The, the Europeans that came to India recognize that thoroughly. Don't throw this patrimony away. Look at it, study it, understand these different types of syntheses. They really hold up well over time. And even the charming more or less uh, European expressions, the way local expression came into them is extraordinary. So. Values unique to classic planning are number one, that architecture is central to urbanism. What it looks like is gonna completely tell you what your, your experience is. Number two, it is genuinely holistic. This is not an analytical method, it is genuinely holistic. Number three, we haven't talked about this at all. It is all about working together with town and country and the rhythms of the one and the rhythms of the other, which are so different. Um, you know, in autonomous vehicles, they try to have the same rules for town and country, and they have accidents, people get killed. If they knew that they have to switch a setting from town to country, they would probably have fewer people dead. And then finally, that crafts are essential. India, of all the countries, probably still maintains some of the finest craftspersons there are in the building arts, and it could be that manual construction is essential for human society and planetary well-being. So we learned how we got here. We learned what science says. We know what to do. Now join the movement, buy the book, call on us, and make beautiful. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Nir, for a very inspiring talk. And that, that really sets, sets the agenda of our little intervention to support our colleagues in India who know what the solutions are, who want to save their tradition against other Indian colleagues who just uh, ignore the traditions that want to import the worst from all the mistakes in, in the West. So thank you, Nir, for that. And now we go to Katie Ryan Balagdas, who is an expert in uh, biophilia. And Katie is speaking to us from somewhere on the East Coast uh new york or um, connecticut where are you katie katie we cannot hear you hi good evening um yes i am i am speaking to you from brooklyn new york and um thank you all for having me uh i feel like you've all touched um those of you who have spoken already have touched on a lot of the issues that support um, that create a nice foundation for what I'm going to spend the next few minutes on, um, the science and economics of biophilia. So um, basically, the, the, the focus of the work that I do is helping translate a lot of the science that everyone's been talking about to um, direct application within the built environment. So supporting architects and designers in, in making that research um, uh, a, a real a part of the practice and authentic practice, practice um, of, of architecture and design um, from, from urban planning to space planning to product design as well. So um, for, for anyone who is not as, um, familiar with biophilic design. Um, it was originally uh, coined by um, Eric Fromm um, in 1964 and later uh, popularized by Harvard biologist um, Ed Wilson um, in his publications on biophilic hypothesis. Uh, he defined it as an um, innately emotional affiliation with human beings and other, other living organisms. And tonight we've heard a couple other variations on that definition, and it certainly has evolved um, depending on like how we're applying it. So I think um, we can think very broadly about biophilia, um, but the biophilic design really translate the hypothesis into practice through research-based inspirations of nature. And I'd like to, to spend a few minutes talking about that. Um, so the seminal, seminal study by, by um, Roger Ulrich in 1984, it's uh, been cited 
continuously as, as a seminal study because it revealed, um, it was one of the first to really reveal the potential significance of um, health impacts or health recovery for patients with a, a view to, to nature. And, and in this study in particular, it wasn't necessarily a spectacular view, but it was a, a distinct difference between um, a view to nature versus a view to a brick wall or something that had very little characteristics. Um, but over the decades of continued research, a number of themes have surfaced that really give perspective to biophilic design and practice. So I am going to um, give a little background or talk about each of these themes as a way to summarize some of the science. So um, the British geographer Jay Appleton first proposed the notion of prospect refuge, um, suggesting saying that certain environmental conditions meet basic human psychological needs by offering like, the capacity to observe without being exposed. So protection overhead and to the back, but also having um, a distant view. So while prospect and refuge are unique conditions in and of themselves, research suggests that the positive experience um, is strengthened when the two prospect and refuge are combined. Um, Prospect and refuge are two of the most commonly utilized biophilic design patterns. However, uh, the design challenge is often finding the right balance between the two for the specific project and, and its users. So the application to an interior design versus um, urban planning. Obviously, there's uh, many possibilities. Another theme is in visual processing, and, and Anne talked quite a bit about this, as well as um, neuro, actually everybody I think has touched on this at some degree, whether it's about fractals or other things, but um, the trees, water, um, people, and grass, and you know, the, all these items are the semantic elements of a landscape. Um, and research tells us that our capacity to process, um, make associations, and sustain interest in these elements increases with greater information density. Um, our capacity to do this visual processing um, explains why most of us will find these four pictures increase in interest from left to right. Um, in the built environment, this translates to, um, like that's been said today already, the, that complex, dynamic, architectural, in, um, architectural elements are going to be perceived as more interesting than less complex geometries. So there's a lot of, there's a diversity of research out there that supports this. Um, and the idea here is, is that this general concept that more co complex organized um, is going to be more interesting than, uh, you know, that, that plain it nondescript, you know, where's the door experience. Um, so just to recap on fractals, um, this, this idea of um, being able to, to process more easily the fractals or the, the and patterns that we see in nature is uh, referred to as fractal fluency. So the, in the built environment, we're um, able to, uh, our brain is more easy, our, sorry, um, we're more easily able to um, and efficiently and more fluidly process these naturally occurring fractals. And, um, you know, this, this topic has already been covered, but um, when it comes to biophilic design, the practice of biophilic design, we see it most often, and classical architecture, uh, we most see it mostly in fenestration, hierarchies, um, building profiles, city skylines, um, and that the, the the classical urban plans. Um, another, uh, another theme in the research is attention restoration theory, which posits that experiencing nature, uh, the prefrontal cortex of the brain quiets down, allowing, allowing it to use less energy when we process what we're experiencing. So this influences our cognitive behavior, our personality expression, decision-making, um, and also moderates our social behavior. So research su suggests that it takes less than fewer than 40 seconds of viewing nature for this shift to occur within the brain. So um, it, it can have a, sig a significant ex um, 
impact on how we function throughout the day by having those periodic um, opportunities to rest the brain through nature. Um, acoustics. Acoustics is the science of sound, um, and it's it's a you know essential topic in any um, on any architectural project. But psychoacoustics is the science of sound perception, or what the brain subconsciously chooses to hear um, and what meaning we attach to that sound. Um, research indicates that while mechanical masking methods like white noise may be an effective acoustic treatment, it's the psychoacoustics of a babbling brook or bird song and the positive perception we attribute to those two sounds um, that enable more effective relaxation and stress recovery. So in the built environment, water sounds has often been explored as a tool for not just sound masking, but also um, relaxation within the workplace. And finally, um, one last theme is allesthesia, also known as thermal delight which was first introduced in 1992 by French physiologist, Michel Cabanac. Um, allesthesia can be temporal or spatial um, experience, particularly as thermal stimuli, but it's also visual, auditory, gustatory, or olfactory sensory stimuli. Um, in workplace design in particular, allesthesia manifests as a conditioning of people, uh, particularly their hands and feet, as opposed to conditioning of the entire space. Um, and so familiar design mechanisms are operable windows, um, tabletops that are made from materials with differing thermal properties, such as wood and metal. Um, but so there's, there's hundreds upon hundreds of studies and we've only, you know, we've heard just a few of them today, um, but they all look at these, the health outcomes of experiences with nature, as well as what it means to be depraved of those experiences within the built environment. So back in 2012, uh, to better understand what the research was telling us and how it could be applied to architecture and design, Terrapin organized much of that research into distinct experiences of nature. And in doing so, patterns surfaced. So each of those patterns we're supporting different health outcomes or combination of health, health outcomes. And to, to make this a, a able to, to enable conversation around these, the science and the, these patterns, we found it appropriate to look to Christopher Alexander um, and the, the applicability of a pattern language to kind of popularize or socialize the idea of biophilic design within architecture and interior design and urban planning. So today we work with 15 science-based patterns of biophilic design um, and they're organized into three main categories. And I'm, I'm not gonna go through all of them today. We don't have time, but um, in just at high level, the, there's nature in the space, which includes patterns that introduces plants, waters, light um, and, and air, uh, into the built environment um, and uh, presence of water. I, it, it's good to note that NUR, uh, it was, or sorry, not NUR, um, uh, Philip mentioned this as you know something within the resilience and adaptive design. So I think there's uh, really strong correlations between these two pattern languages. Um, natural analogs are more indirect experiences with nature that introduce forms, materials, complexity, um, and fractals. Uh, kind of bridge a lot of these patterns. Um, and uh, then finally, the third category would be nature of the space, which is uh, includes patterns that introduce more uh, naturally occurring spatial characteristics into the built environment. So within the research, um, it, there's we're starting to see the value propositions um, into workplace design, hotel design, schools, hospitals, communities, and other building or um, business types that are designed to support these connections with nature. And um, just to touch lightly on what some of that research, or one example of that research is this project that was done in uh, Maryland 
um, in the US that looked at a elementary school. Um, and one of the important things about this project was that it was an existing building, low, um, it was targeting a low income population and had a very small budget. And so, you know, looking at what's possible, like wh what, what is a realistic or replicable model for incorporating biofilm design for the benefit of, in this case, the students and teachers. And this study looked at uh, a classroom, a sixth grade mathematics classroom, um, and incorporated three or four um, elements of biofilm design, focusing on fractals and biomorphic forms. You'll see the uh, carpet, the uh, frieze on the wall above the teacher in this image. Uh, and then the Meco shades, which had a screen printed on this fractal pattern of that kind of resembled the trees from the outside. Uh, and the, the existing or the control classroom was the lower left image and the biophilic cl classroom was on the, the right. And over a school year, uh, biometrics were taken and uh, testing uh, tests testing score performance was tracked and there was a um, three uh, three times greater improvement in the biophilic classroom among student performance and so you know this sounds great for the students well-being and all but when we start thinking about how what, what is what is the real value to even small interventions like this is that it uh, it builds over generations. So science and economics tells us that kids who have exposure to more biophilic learning environments will learn better, they're more relaxed, um, and they have higher graduation rates. And when you have higher graduation rates, um, there tends to be a higher uh, matriculation rate into um, university, college or university. And when you have a college or university degree, you're more likely to um, get a higher paying job and so on. The cycle continues and then contributing back into your, into your um, reinvesting or staying, not having to suffer the community of brain drain. So it's a, this cycle and while those economic benefits don't have a direct relation to say the interior design that you're, that you're supporting or the landscape, it all is connected. It's a big complex web. So, um, and another quick example of what bioeconomics of biophilia really look like is that, um, you know, we are often talking about sustainability and energy performance of buildings is really important, but it's a, it's a very small portion of where the, the value lies. And when you have upwards of 90% of the cost of operating, say, an office, for example, is in the salaries and benefits of your staff, your 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 employees. Then any per small percentage improvement in their health and well-being impacts their performance, their productivity, and that um, is good for the bottom line, no matter how you look at it. Okay, the time. Yep, I'm all done. Um, so just another way to think about. Um, biophilic design and cost and health benefit is this balance balancing of um, you know what you can what small impacts you can what small interventions you do um, and what their actual relative health benefit is so if it's so small that it's not making a health benefit is it really worth it so um, just something to consider when we're when we're really trying to figure out what's the best plan of action and so to learn more um, here are three books. The, the latter two are, um, uh, the first one came out last year and um, the other two, 14 Patterns of Biophilic Design and the Economics of Biophilia are very available free on our website. And I will share a link to that, um, to those documents in the chat momentarily. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you, Katie. Well. Everyone who's listening today is very intelligent. I think you can judge that this is a revolution, a paradigm shift in how we design the environment for the health, for the intelligence of our children, for the future of humankind. Okay, so now we go to uh, an architectural historian. <laughs> no, architectural historians are useless. 
we have a real neuroscientist, Alexandr Lavras, who is going to speak to us from Bolzano, Italy. Thank you for joining us, Alexandr. Please go ahead. Thank you very much, Nikos. It's a pleasure to be part of this of this uh, panel. Um, let me um, share my presentation. So I'm going to pick up from basically from when Anne left. Well, I'm going to, she gave a very nice introduction to what I'm going to, to talk about. So mostly it's going to be about pre-attentive gaze and some uh, related uh, subjects. So you have these two views. Everybody prefers the view on the left. And everybody knows that everybody prefers the view on the left, except for some architects. Although I would, I would, I would submit that they probably know deep down that they don't want to admit it. And the question is, why is this the case? And we, we actually, there was a lot of discussion about why this is the case already. So I'm going to, to try to, to, to contribute to this discussion a little bit based um, in, in a large part to, to, on, 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 um, on eye tracking or on this eye tracking software. So this is a nice drawing by Nikos of a lion. And you see that immediately we are drawn to the eyes of the lion. And there's a reason for that because if you meet a lion in the jungle, and you don't register the lion instantly, you die. So to avoid dying, you have to register it instantly. And to register in a way that, that, that does not have the luxury of, of examining it, but um, just reacts, okay? So I don't want to scare you too much with this, but this is, I, I have to say a few things about this diagram. So this is uh, a brain. And on the left, you see the retina, which is the photoreceptors in our eyes. And you see all this flow of information going towards first the thalamus, which is the relay station for information in the brain, and then to other parts of the brain, mostly the visual cortex, which is the place where um, conscious vision is, is sort of, um, well, the consciousness of vision takes place, so to speak. So, so if you have a damage at, uh, at, at V1, you, you, you say you're blind. But there are other parts of the visual system which are older, more primitive in a way, but also very essential for our survival. One part is this thing, the yellow thing here called the superior colliculus. What this thing does is it makes you react instantly to stimuli which are, well, which present something that evolutionary, evolution, evolution has made it's obvious that it's worth reacting to. Okay, so the lion is, is one of them. So you have something moving uh, on the side and coming towards you, 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 you look instantly. And you do this because the superior colliculus tells you so. And this is a much older structure than the visual cortex. Birds don't have a cortex, but they have a superior colliculus. So, and by the way, there's this discussion that the, 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 the evolution of our vision is related to threats from the environment. This book, uh, Lynn Isbell is in California in, in, in um, I don't remember where in California. She's a professor in California, forget the university. And she had this, this idea that the evolutionary pressure from predators is something that has helped our brains evolve the vision that we have. And you know, it, it may seem surprising, but in, in primates it has been reported that is, there, is a, there are circuits in the thalamus that react specifically to snakes, specifically to snakes. So it is so, so specific. And it's of course, no wonder that you have dragons in mythology, yes? So this is just to show how deeply, um, how innate some responses are and how um, we cannot escape millions and millions of years of evolution that goes back before the, before the emergence of, 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 of humans. Okay, so, um, this is this is some results of a study we did with with uh, with Nikos and Anne, and we use this 3M vast software. And I'm going to show you a number of pictures, uh, so you get a better idea of how you can use this um, to 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 study to study architecture. So this is uh, in Italy in Pavia. It's the church of the monastery of the Certosa di Pavia, and you see there is so much detail everywhere. That the whole of the of the of the of the subject of the picture is is covered more or less by this pre-attentive map. So it's all scanned. It's all scanned pre-attentively before we realize what we're looking at. 
course, this is St. Peter's in Rome. Uh, it's all, again, it's all covered. You see what Anne mentioned, that people mostly are looking for people and for a good reason. So all the glorious architecture here is, 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 is visible, but of course, people are, are quite important in this map. Here you see on the left, this is in Shiraz in Iran. Uh, it's a typical Persian garden with this uh, two or 300 year old mansion in it. And it's, you see, it's all covered apart from the areas in the shade. The right turn of the century building in Innsbruck in Austria, again, the same, uh, only the areas that are in the shade are not covered so much. So there is, there is so much detail in all of this that is all, um, it's, it's all attracting this pre-attentive gaze. Uh, this is uh, again from, from Iran, um, a mural. So you look at the mural and you see this pattern and then you zoom into the mural. So this picture I had taken with enough resolution so you can zoom in. So this is at the bottom, you see a part of the same mural. And again, what was before almost ignored because it was too small to notice, you zoom in and you see the detail. So um, that's a key in all this pre-modern architecture that you can zoom in and there is something more to see. And of course that's related to fractals, statistical fractals in this case. So here, so here you have the kind of juxtaposition. This is in Athens in Greece, you have a two banks in your classical building of the 19th century with some extensions done later on the right and the late 20th century building on the left. Um, if you look at the top, um, you see that both, they seem to be equally covered by the heat map. And that's because when they built the modern building, they sort of respected geometrically the, the neighboring building. So they made the same height before the, the recessed floors. They, they use a sort of spacing of windows that is regular. So that from a distance is it's okay. As, as you go closer in, you see that the modern building starts to fall apart uh, in terms of the, the attention map, yeah? Whereas the, the neoclassical building, there's, there's more to discover in it. The closer in you go, the more there is to discover. So more examples, various pictures I've taken from various places around the world. This is in, in Brno in the Czech Republic. This is in San Diego in California. You see the same motif. Uh, the the pre-attentive gaze is drawn to the area where there's more detail. And when there is, there are more iterations of that detail. So you can go further in and you, you will discover more. And just to, to prove the, what I just said, okay, this is the Prudential building in Boston. Uh, you have a look at it and you see that the, 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 the pre-attentive gaze is attracted at the top. Initially, I thought it was the sign. It's not the sign because if you remove it, nothing changes. I think it's the fact that this is highly contrasty and from this distance, it attracts attention. Uh, if, you, if you move closer in and the rest of the building is completely ignored. Yeah. If you move closer in, this sort of complexity of the different floors starts registering, but the closer in you go, the more our perceptive system realizes there's nothing more there to see. So in, in F, and F is not really so much zoomed in, that's three floors height, so it's not uh, exactly detailed. It's completely collapsed because our perceptive system knows there's no more surprises than we just, just realize there's this repetitive pattern that Nikos referred to in the, in the drawings. It's just a repetition, nothing more to see, let's go somewhere else. So. Um, here is the practice of having a, a new um, glass facade behind an old building. If you want to sort of non-intrusively put an addition, the left is in Tehran in Iran, the right one is in Athens in Greece. Different buildings. This one is in the 20s, the, the, the Iranian one, the Greek one is in the 1830s, uh, but the result is the same. Uh, in this case, one might say it's actually a good thing because the purpose is not to be distracted by the background, but this is an exception because what happens if that's all you have? I mean, it's okay as a background, but if, that's, if, if the building is just a glass facade, what happens? This is in Manchester. So you see the, the neoclassical theater on the left attracts all the pre-attentive gaze uh, movements, the building and the cloud, yes, because the cloud has a kind of uh, fractal structure. And all these glass cloud buildings are, are ignored. So, 
and this is uh, okay here i have molested the duomo in milan by by uh, replacing the facade by um, um, a curtain wall and here i have just followed the the outline and here i have reduced the detail and here i didn't follow the outline and of course you see the less faithful you are to the to the original complex building the less the eye is drawn to it in the end it's completely ignored and you're just it's just looking trying to find people uh, on the piazza so and to sort of test it in the most abstract way what we used here is the Sierpinski carpet which is a mathematical fractal so it's not something you'll find in nature or in architecture and in the that's in a and in the in the there are different versions which are created by by omitting um, different levels different scale levels yes and you see that the more you omit the less the eye is drawn to it the simplest ones are basically ignored yes. okay so somebody might say at this point and i will try not to be too long uh okay but you told us that this is um this is useful for threat. So are these old buildings threatening? No. The idea is that you make, you're attracted to them. And then of course, using different studies, using studies of salience, you can tell if you like them or not. And of course we know that we like them, but I have, I have done uh, in a previous paper, uh, I, have, I have used questionnaires for, for things like this. And I've even planted fractal and non-fractal uh, forms in landscapes and people found the fractal forms and these are uh, mathematical fractals yeah so there's no issue of familiarity they found them more beautiful more interesting and even more familiar which is i think revealing because if you look at b this is the only thing that could look a little bit revealing why would c look uh, would look familiar excuse me why would c look familiar at least B looks like a curtain wall building, and still people found it more familiar. And the same here, I replaced the whole village with fractal and non-fractal graphics. And um, related to what Katie said about complexity, by reducing the complexity of a natural scene, people immediately like it much less. So you can immediately see how this B is voted down because I've made the the sizes of the of the of the of the stones uh, equal, and I have removed some plants and, and so forth. And in, in here is the same. C, by the way, is the natural scene. A is the boring one where all the, the pebbles are the same, and B has is the natural scene plus some tropical vegetation, which doesn't belong in the Alps because this is from the Alps, but still people found it beautiful. So it's 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 a good. Um, it's uh, a good indication of um, what people, how people react to complexity. Uh, Alexander, uh, time, time. Time, almost, almost there. <laughs> <laughs> there are studies now that, uh, that show us that the way that we register fractals is special. The default mode network, which is a functional network in the brain that is related to sort of Non, non external task related, it's daydreaming, mind wandering, etc. etc. That is used to, um, to register fractals. So these are the issues. There seems to be a tuning to fractals, the scaling order. There's a functional utility to this tuning, avoiding danger or the orienting towards safety, food towards the face of the mother, and creating order out of chaos. And this is why. It is stressful, and we know that it is stressful to be in an environment with only class club buildings because you cannot register them and you cannot create order out of chaos. You are in chaos, and chaos creates stress, technically creates stress. You can measure it. And when all this comes together, we can talk about beauty. The final slide is just a word of caution. Late Sir Roger Scruton was a bit uh, worried that some other enthusiastic neuroscientists working on uh, neuroaesthetics might like to rebrand um, art and aesthetics as branches of neuroscience. It's not the case. No, I, I wanted to actually write to him, but unfortunately it's not possible anymore. The idea is that you understand that there is a neurological underpinning to all that. 
So you strengthen your argument. Your argument. You're not trying to replace these disciplines with neuroscience. It would be like trying to replace um, to replace a cook with a, with a chemist. The experience of the food cannot be described by chemistry. So the experience of art is not described by neuroscience, but it helps to know that there is a natural, uh, an actual underpinning, and that all that we're talking about now has has a neurological basis. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alexandros. And uh, so now we are finished with the guests. Uh, thank you so much for having us. And we'll go back to India to Prem Chandavarkar, who will uh, conclude our series of speakers. Prem, it's in your lap. Thank you. I cannot hear uh, you. OK, good. Yeah. Uh, so I'll just open my presentation. Oops, sorry, wrong slide. Yeah, I'm going to talk about practice. And that's because although practice is the primary means by which architecture is made, it's a poorly researched and conceptualized notion. We talk about the practice of architecture, but not enough about the architecture of practice. And we have certain assumptions of it, which have historical roots, which come from the age of enlightenment and which is also the roots of um, concepts of modernity and democracy where there was a rebellion against traditional feudal authority, claiming in the inherent worth of all humans. And, and there was a core argument to be made here, which that, and, and they were influenced by science emerging as a discipline with real status. And the argument was that everyone has the capacity to reason and therefore everyone is inherently worthy. And because you can reason, you can think of new things. So history is the arrow of progress over time. And therefore, the avant-garde thinker or artist is the revolutionary agent of history. And this had implications that the privileging of reason led to an abstracted cult of expertise. And where scientific method was not easily transferable, there was no clear dividing line between rhetoric and theory. And that led to the celebrity personality as the embodiment of expertise and a practice based on idealist paradigms constructed by the so-called expert rather than being evidence-based. So the impact on architectural practice was that we, when we think of the cutting edge, we tend to, tend to name individuals, persons, and uh, validation is socialized through peer review. Architects think about, you know, judge themselves by, does my work win design awards? Is it published in the reputed journals and so on? And they wind up designing for the approval of other architects rather than the constituencies they meant to serve. Uh, so abstract interpretation trumps the actual experience of inhabitation. We create a culture of heroes and imitators instead of widespread rigor. And there's a disconnect between the celebration of star architects and the culture of inhabitation. And there's a lack of clar clarity on how theory and practice relates. So that has led to the assumption of what the prevailing practice model is, that the individual genius is the cutting edge of creativity and practice is just a vehicle for the expression of that genius. And meaning and purpose, the genius is the sole source of everything. And peer review is the best mode of validating practice. Uh, the more radical the design is, the more creative it is. And practice and theory belong to different spaces. Theory belongs to academia practice in the world of firms. So I'm looking at recent findings well, much after the age of enlightenment, particularly in the last couple of two to three decades of what uh, science can teach us. Uh, starting with Ian McGillchrist, a neuroscientist who looks at the question of why the brain is divided. And there's a popular myth that each hemisphere handles uh, different functions, which, which is wrong. There is considerable overlap in the functions of both hemispheres, but they pay attention in different ways. The left hemisphere is detail oriented where the right is context oriented. And we have built a cultural bias towards the left hemisphere, perhaps because it is more uh, effective in exerting power. And therefore we fail to adequately contextualize our work and we build paradigms that rest on this last lack of contextualization. The cognitive scientist, Alison Gopnik, uh, doesn't cite Mikhail Chris, but her work resonates in many ways where she talks about two kinds of consciousness, spotlight consciousness and lantern consciousness. 
and the spotlight seeks to uh, focus on goals it seeks to exploit the environment whereas the lantern is just seeks to illuminate as much as possible and it's it wants to explore it wants to learn and children in their early years have a natural orientation uh, toward lantern consciousness but as we mature into adulthood we develop a vested interest in certainty and develop a bias towards spotlight consciousness so our capacity to learn sensitivity to new evidence reduces and we cling to biases which give us certainty but we can train our brain to retain lantern consciousness and we do see talented individuals who somehow are born with that inherent capacity who do so but this needs a nurturing environment just as children need the security of a family to really uh, explore and learn uh, we need to create the nurturing conditions for this uh, neuroscientist anil seth looks at the nature of consciousness and says there is a difference between consciousness and intelligence and consciousness is rooted in our inherent nature as living breathing embodied beings we don't talk about artificial consciousness and we don't even know if that is ever possible we have no evidence to suggest that and consciousness is not a response to stimulus it is a continuous process of prediction affirmed through interaction with an environment that's driven more by inside out thinking rather than the outside in thinking that instrumental reason uh, pushes us towards and what we call reality is a consensus built on predictions affirmed through behavior and action and prediction seeks both information uh, which is new uh, data as well as integration with the with the environment and this integration is both external to the body and also internal to it we are sensitive to what's happening within and because our environment is always changing consciousness seeks to achieve allostasis which is the stability through change rather than homeostasis which is consistent equilibrium uh, this resonates with what the scholar of myth joseph campbell said when he argues that it's a mistake to think that we seek the meaning of life what we seek is the rapture of being alive and this allostasis is sought both internally to the sense of self as well as externally the sense of a comprehensible world and both self and world are subject to change over time uh, the science writer annie murphy paul draws research from a variety of sources to say that we've been handicapped by metaphors such as the brain is a computer or a muscle and that we have a neurocentric bias that the brain does all the thinking and we actually think beyond our brains we think with our bodies and this is more than just the you know the cliche phrase gut feeling but even gestures and movement help us to think we think with our surroundings and of course there's a, a, a thousands of years of evolution in interpreting nature that affects us but it's it's also architecture we uh, think with architecture for example we deposit memories in architecture if you want to recall your childhood perhaps more effective than even the family photo album if you if you examine the house in which you grew up you get a much more rich uh, recollection and we think through our relationships and many of the cognitive biases we develop arise from isolating our brains but that that extension you know that extended mind cannot violate the inherent coherence of evolutionary patterns that have evolved over thousands of years and there's a whole host of writing learning mainly from biology but in taking it into complexity theory where it says that coherence does not require top down conceptualization and control which is what rationality assumes and that complex systems can organize themselves systems have elements interaction and purpose and self organization occurs through elements recognizing patterns within their interaction so a system coheres to iterative evolutionary spirals of interaction and pattern recognition where the focus is on the authenticity of interaction rather than a priori grand narratives and complex systems display emergence the capacity to hold fundamental properties that cannot be found in earlier states of the system uh, this is how we intuitively live just take an example like friendship we don't find friends by first constructing a philosophy of friendship probably we wouldn't find friends if we set out to do that we just interact with friends we recognize resonances patterns in the interaction and then one day we find in a group of friends the quality of friendship which did not exist in the first interactions 
Interaction is distributed across scale hierarchies of nested systems, but coherence must emerge from the bottom up. And purpose must have evolutionary foundations within the system and cannot be forced upon the system from outside. So to conclude, uh, I suggest that we need to look at what I laid out as the prevailing practice model and upend all of its assumptions. That creat creativity is more consistent, widespread and impactful when emergent from human nature and its interactions. And we find this in craft traditions where the average quality achieved is far more consistent than what you find in modern design cultures. The practice is not a vehicle for the genius. It works best when it is a place uh, that is a complex system that's not personality centric and that provides that nurturing environment for, for lantern consciousness, sheltering the relationships that breed creativity. So in this system, expertise is shared and recycled. Uh, meaning accrues through inhabitation, how it emancipates the inhabitants consciousness and potential for life. And so just as the way people write memories into architecture, and this is a process that starts after the architect has stepped away from the work. And validation occurs through pattern recognitions in the relationships with self, collaborators, constituencies served and world inhabited. It is not personality centric and is nurtured and sensitized through rigorous and repetitive practice that we have to seek with the self collaborators, the constituency we serve and the world we inhabit. Creativity must reflect an impact on inhabitations that are allostatic, that is they're emancipatory, that provide new information, new possibilities, as well as affirm affirmative, they integrate us with our sense of self and the world. And just as we move between lantern and spotlight consciousness to learn between detail and context to learn the relations of a practice must have hold both the spaces of practice must hold both practice and theory. So that practice is a way of critiquing theory and uh, theory is a way of critiquing practice. Thank you. Thank you, Prem. So uh, that concludes our presentations. I want to thank the uh, I want to thank everyone for uh, a wonderful talks. So let me list the people again: Philip Rose and Sussman, Nir Buras, Katie Ryan, Balagdas, Alexander Zlavdas, and Prem Chandavarkar. And uh, this was a wonderful thing. And and the purpose of today's webinar is to present this information, not well known, to architects and students in India. And I will make um, one thing. I will emphasize one thing. We have offered this open information. The, most of this is available free. There's nothing secret here. We're offering it free. Contrast this to architectural culture today saying that the design of this award-winning building is a, a, lies in the, the mind of the star architect who's getting a hundred million dollar fee for this horrible building. It's, it's, a, it's a secret, okay, because it's a genius thing. Well, Prem just demolished that. It's, there is no secret, it's all a pretense. It's a way to make money at the expense of, of the city and of the culture. So I, I hope this message uh, has gone across. So uh, we're ready now to go into the question and answer session. Where is Kirti or Ankisha? Maybe you would like to uh, read some of the questions so that we can engage in a round table. So we don't take too much more time. Yeah, uh, so there is one question for you. Uh, you once com commented that that there is a specific word used only by architects to designate what is beautiful. So what is that word? So that is asked by Silvana Lenis. Uh, I'm afraid I did not understand that. What what word? Uh, what is beautiful? Oh, well, um, uh, some contemporary architects look at the building that causes anxiety. If we, if we remember the talk by Alexander Zlavdas, who's a real neuroscientist, some buildings create anxiety. We feel like we're being attacked by a lion, okay? That makes us sick and we want to run away. So there are architects today who are building buildings that make us feel like a lion is attacking us. And they think this is beautiful. No, it's not beautiful, it's terrible. 
this is malpractice, professional malpractice. Okay, that's so the word is anxiety. Does yes. anyone want to comment? Anyone else of the panel want to comment on this? Anxiety inducing buildings that are win, win prizes and awards. Well, I just want to say that, as I mentioned before, that there have actually been technical measures of, of measurements of stress, you know, through electrodermal responses and a lot of people walking in areas that there are surrounded by glass clad buildings versus people working in areas where there are buildings that have the kind of organized complexity that we're talking about. So it's been it's been verified at the most basic technical level, you know, changes in skin conductance. Yeah. Yeah, so another question for Professor uh, Alexandra says, can you please comment on habituation versus the interest and the visual tracking you are talking about? Is this is for me? Yes, sir. Well, could you please repeat the question because I didn't get it. Yeah. Can you please comment on habituation versus the interest and the visual tracking you are talking about? I'm not, I'm not sure exactly how to, to put it. I think that in terms of practical uh, application, this kind of using this kind of software can give an idea used to examine and to predict the kind of people of responses of people that they would have in a specific architecture. So, I mean, that, that would be the, the practical the practical application. Providing I... it's, done, it's done properly and it's not, um, and you know, because it's it's sometimes also prone to, to, to artifacts. So you have to, to actually implement it properly. Yeah, please. Uh, Katie, you wanted to add something? Well, I, I, not necessarily add, but maybe, um dissect the question a little bit more by, by um, habituation. Is it, is, is the person asking the question referring to like repetitive experience of that building? So you have, you know, there's this visual tracking that's going on, but once you've seen that building twice, 10 times every day, you know, do, do you respond in the same way? Um, does it, does it, does that interest sustain over time. Meanwhile, if I may add, I just uh, I just heard the word habituation because I heard habitation before and I was answering to that. So I just heard habitation. Okay. So I answered a different question, but that's okay. So. If, if, I, if I could add something to that, uh, because I spoke about inhabitation producing meaning. And it's because uh, there are many things like we write, uh, uh, we write memory into design by into architecture by inhabiting it and it becomes richer over time so so when we see the building after a few years we see it with those memories we don't it's different from the first expression uh, so we have to design for for that memory uh, we the way we are trained as architects we are trained to try and create a first impact does someone see the building and say wow but actually the real test of good architecture is can you inhabit it for years and look back at those years with affection. And uh, I've written an article on it that's on academia.edu, which uh, uh, say that we, we are trained in an aesthetics of expression, that is actually what we should be thinking about is an aesthetics of absorption, about how the work absorbs meaning through inhabitation. It's not the meaning we put into it. We have to create the potential for that inhabitation making the work meaningful. Meanwhile, now that I actually got the question right, if I may add something, uh, I think there is space for additional sort of conditional, conditioned responses through habituation. Um, I always remember uh, something that I had um, read many years ago that Leonard Bernstein, the, the musician, was saying about music. He was a proponent of tonal music, but he was saying that he was saying that the responses to music are, are rooted in earth, as he was saying. And for me, it's the same with architecture, and that is the tonal, the tonal sequence. But that does not, does not preclude additional responses which are caused 
by habituation or whatever. So, but this is an extra layer, it's not as deep. So you can, you can have habituation induced responses to many things, um, whether that is uh, in the end, I think that's it, healthy or really enjoyable is, is, another, is another question. So I think it's, it's a combination of two, of, 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 of these two. It's a combination of our innate responses and the, the responses that have to do with habituation. But obviously the innate responses are more important. Uh, near, uh, Dr. Bura says his hand up. Don't put your hand um, up, just, just come in and talk. This is a free for all. Free for all, okay. Yeah. Um, so one of the things we explored in our research just now is the actual millisecond sequence of perception. It turns out in the first 50 to 100 milliseconds, all this fractal stuff gets, uh, gets processed even before at about 80, you recognize a face as a face before you actually recognize the person. So these things happen very, very fast and they do have to do with well-being in the environment. And since art imitates nature, what we need to do is provide an, a, a, a built environment that imitates the experience and in its experience, the experience of being in a, in a multiple fractal nice, place in nature somehow or other. Um, this actually was figured out in all the cultures with various degrees of, of, of um, possibility. And really the notion of progress that we have to move away from something that was before, create stuff that's recognizably different in and of for themselves has replaced the practice of human-oriented design. My question is, okay, we are here actually closing a circle with using science to tie the ends of the snake to, to understand that, you know, there, is, there are many ways to do things. Uh, you know, there's one really good way, it's tried and proven for about 5,000 years, 2,500 in discourse among all the cultures together. And there are all the other ways, you know? So my question is, um, it's very nice. And I'm really happy that in the last hundred years, we've done all these experimentations, modernist art and modernist design and so on and so forth, so that we, we don't have to do it much again. And we can come back to human oriented types of things. The other side of it is the holistic business. You know, holism, if, if you take something and analyze it into however many patterns and so on and so forth, it's like uh, dissecting a cat and, and you can't put the dissected cat back together again. It's not gonna meow. So you need a different kind of approach. And how do we actually create, invent, uh, conceive uh, holistic approaches? So I think that we have here in this really great panel, probably some of the leadership and moving forward towards uh, uh, holistic, uh, genuinely holistic approaches. And, and I really enjoyed hearing uh, Prem and, and the, the consciousness bit. Um, the, the, the big, and, 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 and Katie with her, I, I really loved the spectrum that Katie put together and, and the images. Um, uh, Philip's notions touch me deeply because I think that we're all connected in, in that kind of a way. And um, uh, uh, Alexandros really, uh, I think he drilled down into the, um, into the um, VAS, into the uh, eye tracking in a way that I felt more informed and more comfortable in, in his interpretation of things because uh, I myself, together with Anne, together with Nikos and with others have been experimenting with it. And it was, I think the interpretation of the results is something that, that we, we need to look at. So really thank you for, for all this. Um, and I hope that we can um, help save the world. Well, I'll just add to that briefly, Nir. I've, I've loved this panel. Guys, this is great. <laughs> you guys are the best. The, the, the recipe, we weren't quite sure what we were making, and I think we made a beautiful 
um, what shall I say this soup <laughs> or is it a cake? But what it's I wanted really to say, great stew. yeah, it's a great stew, but it's the way forward. I think to answer your question here, I think we have to really start talking about what was ignored in the 20th century, which is the actual physical, biological, human experience of place. People matter, stress matters, well-being matters. It's so funny. You go to the bookstore for Harvard Business School now, and they have an, a new series of books that came out in 2018 about emotional intelligence. So if you study at Harvard Business School, you have to read a book about happiness, resilience, another book on empathy. You will learn that bosses who are more empathetic have more successful companies. Those words, empathy, resilience, happiness, were never mentioned once in my architectural education at UCLA. They were never mentioned once on my national licensing exam that I had to take over 12 hours. So in the 21st century, we need to bring those words, resilience, happiness, empathy, into design. That's what we should be studying. And now we have these biometric tools that Alexandros, Nikos, that I have been working with. We can actually show how stressful a building will be. Um, that's huge. And, and health and well-being, particularly with COVID, maybe that's the silver lining for COVID, is health and well-being is what we want to talk about. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think at the end of the day, it's all about how good we feel. The interesting thing about what you just said about resilience, happiness, and empathy is they're all good. Problem solving is about not good, something that is not good. So if we are engaged in problem solving, we're dragging the not good wherever we go. It's, it's like a, a ball on chain on, on the leg. The aspirational approach, what do we love? What do we want more of? What would we like to have that we don't have now is what we do in the classical traditional approach. And when I say classical, it really is. It's the like the epitome of human thinking with regard to the built environment of all the cultures. Each one has its own classical, whatever you want to call it. And, and it is an amazing top down, bottom up and, and sideways kind of a dialogue through time. And I, I forget who mentioned time and place, a memory and place. I think it was Prem, right? Um, it so happens mm -hmm. that human memory is place associated. It's not chronological. You remember what you did, where you did it before you remember when you did it. Mm -hmm. And this is something that has come out of wayfinding analysis. Mm -hmm. So the urban memory is essential because without it, we lack validity in the eyes of our own children. If we can't show them where we were, there's no reason for them to believe us. <laughs> so there, this notion of location is far more important. And then you have the business of how to express it best. So um, I'm so excited to be here and thank you very much, um, uh, Nikos, for, for inviting me. And I look forward to working with all of you uh, further in further research and so on. If, if I think back to my experiences in architecture school, there are a couple of very fundamental problems. One, one is the training always had me next to my work talking about it. And it, you know, it, it, it bred a sort of uh, belief that what I had to say was the most important thing. And, and, and actually who was going to inhabit my building sort of you know, was lost beyond the horizon. Uh, but the other thing is that uh, because of the kind of abstractions that were talked about, uh, you know, the, the underlying message there is rely on these abstractions, don't trust your own body. Yeah. And, and, and we are taught to look at everything within the disciplinary lens of what the, the school teaches us as architecture is. And we forget a very fundamental thing that before we are architects, we're all human beings. I and mean, that's not understood in architecture school, right? And so, so you have to learn to trust your body because that's, that's the most fundamental site of discovery. Mm -hmm. Many of the things we hold as so valuable like love and joy and wonder, uh, we might be hard pressed to define them, but we know them as tangible reality when we ex experience them. 
and and we could just start with that learning from there and take it outwards mm -hmm. so so actually i i find in my evolution through my career i've gone through a different set of questions i mean it's not that each question is is uh, less important but it's it uh, uh, loses significance as a starting question i started with a question of what is architecture i went from there to uh, what is my practice and i'm now moving to the question of who is my friend in my practice because in that friend i discover my own humanity mm. oh that's so beautiful <laughs> i just wanted to know why things look the way they do uh, the 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 words didn't fit the music in the modernist world i was teaching it and i was realizing that the words i was using were so so um uh, irrelevant to what actually was on the paper what the people what we were drawing and building and actually i would um i'm a designer i i that that's what i really do so i i give shape to stuff so when i was teaching design contrary to the schools where they would have people hammer out what does space mean and then they, they'd break their heads on the brick wall of space and all these concepts the first lesson i sat down everybody so, somebody in the school where i taught had these uh, uh vocabularies of Mies, frank lloyd wright and le corbusier and i and i we we talked through all the nomenclature i said okay guys you're in a studio now this is a profession you're going to have to use professional language here are the concepts and in retrospect th these are really interesting and semi dumb things um but i i want to tell you something i've been reading a lot of history and i've been teaching traditional design as well and when i speak with my colleagues about traditional design it turns out that there really is no school, there's no method for teaching it other than the MIT Beaux-Arts method, which is English speaking, but then there was also the French, the German, the, the England, the English England uh, 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 school of how to do it, which I don't, I don't know anything about. But then prior to that, every all the architects, they learned from the practice and from books. And this knowledge base was very easy to communicate. I mean, I, I have here my office standard is Gibbs rules, you know. So we are looking at knowledge that, that accrued in dialogue from 500 BC on, more or less. But which, when it started being communicated, to specialized professionals like architects took on different arrangements of doing so. And what filtered through to the 20th century was the French Beaux-Arts method. When I look at it, it's very, it's very Francophile. It has all to do with the technology of construction in France. It's, it's full, you know, French rationalism is one of the worst things that ever happened to architecture. So it has all these all these faults built into it that we of the what we've been experimenting with in the last 200 300 years so we really are at the advent of a new period we have 5000 years of building cities 2500 years of documented history both in the field and in general we have a really good idea of how to do certain things. And we've documented so many experiences. Let's learn from our experience. That's why we're human. That's why we invented writing. Uh, Nir, I want to jump in <clears throat> because I see in the, in the question and answers, a note from my former PhD student, Zahir Alam, who is very, very brilliant and could have been on the panel. So he asks, what about retrofitting existing modernist buildings to make them more habitable? Well, that's a trillion dollar question because there are so many horrible buildings all over the world that are just unlivable. <clears throat> but I want to say that this panel has given- it's in our article, retrofitting. Exactly. This panel has given the seeds of what you can do to retrofit. So somebody who believes what this panel is saying, then I mean, the owner of a building can invest a little bit or more in order to make uh, the building uh, uh, more livable and, and use all these techniques that we have developed and published for free. So we are communicating what can be done. 
to make these horrible uh, existing uh, buildings um, uh, more habitable and uh, more healthy from, from the visual and uh, psychological point of view. Uh, however, uh, as Zahir asks, some of them may not be to human scale. Well, I hate to say that some buildings are so horrible, so overscaled that they cannot be fixed, but we don't have to worry about it because all these monstrous huge buildings have a lifetime of 20 years, okay? These billion dollar buildings have a lifetime of 20 years. So just wait a little bit and <laughs> they're gonna fall down. And uh, hopefully the world will wake up by then in order to replace That's them right. with something more, more human. Uh, uh, <clears throat> A, a famous case study is a housing project that Le Corbusier did. I think it's uh, the place is Pesac. And uh, he, he did the typical cubist boxes you would expect of him. But after that, the inhabitants were given control over what happened to it. And they started adding pitch roof and ornament. And, and in a few years, it was completely unrecognizable. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, um, Nikos, you want me to show the picture of the British embassy that we have in the article? No, oh, why not? Unless um, we have, yeah. Uh, uh, okay, please, please show the picture. But I'm waiting for our host in India to tell us when we're going to be cut off because <laughs> it's late. <laughs> uh, this, this is a, a, this is an egg crate design from the '50s that was built in Washington D.C. Uh, for the British Embassy. It's next to the Edwin uh, Luchin's uh, uh, beautiful. Um, uh, chancery building. Um, and uh, what we proposed was adding one foot of structure in front of it, not rebuilding the whole thing. The concrete's fine, you know, as long as it's kept inside and doesn't get any water, it should last for a pretty long time, even reinforced. Uh, so we just encased the building, and it turns out that not only is it better climatically and so on and so forth, also increased the security 85%. Uh, in addition to which the moldings could actually deflect missiles. So it's like you're starting to, to enter, a, a, this, this is a holistic system. I mean, I, we didn't ask for the security thing. So all we wanted to do is make a pretty building uh, using the floor plan that existed without costing too much. So this is how one could mm -hmm. retrofit. You can face a lot of these buildings and with uh, something that would last and put a real roof on top of it. Why not? You know, this is a hundred year roof on, on top of the building. Thanks. Uh, Nikos, you asked me, I think, you know, how long can we go ahead? Uh, let me tell you this, that, you know, this is so fascinating and it's so beautiful that I'm refusing to look at the watch. Please go ahead as long as you want to. I don't think we have a problem. <laughs> We would lose people, but it doesn't matter. Those who are interested, those who are fascinated by this immensely uh, educative experience, they will stay back. So please continue as long as you could. Don't worry. We don't have a time limit. Please continue. OK, so uh, I'm looking uh, at the chats. And, the, uh, and Kisha has someone from the uh, audience who wants to ask something. Are we ready yeah. for this person? Yes, I'm just allowing him to talk. Uh, Vikram Soni, who has raised his hand, you can please talk. I have allowed you to talk. We are not Hello. hearing anything. I, he is unmuted, but I'm. Um, we are unable to hear you, Vikram. So, Gapas. Uh, no, Nobody we are unable to. Yeah, so maybe we can just continue. Well, <clears throat> while Vikram is is uh, is getting um, uh, uh, the microphone, uh, I see here on the chats uh, a question from Flavio Diaz Miron, who we know is a friend and uh, and uh, near knows him. Fellow of the has, Classic Planning Institute. Yeah, in a hypothetical situation, what would you say to Prime Minister Modi in relation to India's human settlements? Well, what I would say to, uh, to His Excellency is that there are patterns of sustainability that have been built in India for thousands of years. Please pay attention to them and don't go in with bulldozers to tear them down 
and replace them with some harebrained schemes of concrete boxes, because that's the most, that's the key to sustainability. And be careful, be careful, be careful of important public buildings. Don't bring a foreign star architect to build some monstrosity. Build something that's suitable and that uh, uh, respects the scale of India, respects the tradition, respects the context, doesn't cut down any trees. That's what, what I would tell uh, uh, PM Modi. Uh, the, rest, the rest of you maybe have some advice for PM Modi. Yeah, maybe, Nikos, if when you talk about trees, you start to um, talk my language. <laughs> and I think what is really important is this is what's happening with all our cities. And I think Zahir also put in his question about regenerative design. Um, I hear all these beautiful things that everyone is saying. I mean, the science, we look at these buildings, what attracts us and inherently attracts us to these natural forms. Now, trees is one of our best living structures, and it's, it's called the fundamentals of resilience. Now, um, if you really want to continue, and we in a new climate, we, we're facing a huge challenge of climate change, an environment we don't know. Um, yeah building according to the past and current modern modern structures is not um, gonna survive we we know that we we are facing really disaster coming because of the way we build our cities and 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 environment the last 20 21st century on a me mechanistic mechanical approach this is where the modern come is why we sit in this problem now we've got all of these issues so that's where um, our architect and I think architects and and planners we are the core there to make sure that we do regenerative design we do regenerative thinking so our buildings needs to start to become the source of giving back to nature um, our, don't don't cut the trees down we've done a study um, in in the city of Geelong where um, there is an urban forest strategy there's a new framework coming out that um, for Scaredly, it looks like there's going to be these high-rise buildings if they put this framework plan through. But phenomenally, is that there's not even one percent tree canopy cover. So, heat island effect, the impact of heat waves, especially in Australia, we realize now that these concrete structures and these buildings that is monotonous, that glass buildings. I mean, I look at that and I'm and I I, I, I cringe because it is not living structure. Let's bring that living structure back into the city. Make it more beautiful. Bring more trees in. That's very important. The Chinese do trees like I've never seen. They have a tree every eight feet or something on every important street in, I don't know, in Beijing, places that I've been in China. It's really amazing and, and well-maintained landscaping as well. Um, uh, just, yeah. just as a point, I, I agree with that. I think more than that, even though, but we need to reestablish the notion of countryside. Mm. Green zone, green belt, what kind of nonsense is that? Yet another abstraction, 20th century abstraction. If you actually read Ebenezer Howard, he says to cap a garden city population at 32,000 and then leapfrog over countryside miles deep to the next settlement that's actually the answer for india in other words you f you concentrate your um population in, in relatively small enclaves that are separated by countryside that do provide the local food and the trees and whatever else you need in countryside and all the animals running around through their their, their wildlife corridors and 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 also the countryside is the place to hide the ravages of modern life from garbage dumps to high tension wires, mines, all that kind of stuff. You need to surround them by miles of countryside so they don't really have the, the, the more negative impacts. So this business of, of bringing together town and country, whoever said town, who's ever said town and country since 1950, when, when the little drive-in shopping malls were called town and country. I mean, for crying out loud, we've thrown the baby out with the bathwater 
we've thrown a whole family of babies out with the bathwater. Uh, so I think it's time to just bite the bullet and start making beautiful again. And it's very easy to do. And that, that beauty near is really um, fundamental in the structures of nature. I mean, it's um, um, like you say, um, town and country, I would say is why don't we bring country into the town? <laughs> Let the town yeah. or the city yes, become absolutely. country. Um, because um, that... It's interesting now with COVID, um, there's a trend here in, in, in certain areas in Australia because of people are stuck in the cities and totally locked up. Um, obviously, there's serious mental health issues that's happening, but there's a huge move now to move out into the country. So previously, where the, 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 the housing market in the, the regions and the beautiful country um, areas were really really non-existing is now that you can't find any place everyone is moving out of the cities um, for me that is really interesting and we're doing a bit of research on it to identify what is this attraction and and that brings me back to that um, um, four quadrant integral model um, it is it's, it's not just about what we see in and what we experience but it's that's our sensory architecture it is the deep connections to nature it's that um, nature experiences the eye that I really want to be part of it. Then it is also, I want to be part of that element. So it's nature then embracing us and we embrace nature. And then comes the culture. Um, I were talking about indigenous knowledges. If you look at the layers that's lying there, um, Ian McHawk's labor cake model, if we build from the bottom up and you look what's the deep connection, especially from indigenous knowledges is, Country, they call it country. So country is the land and the fundamental patterns mm. that make us feel good, that gives us health and well-being. Bring that back into the cities. Now, how could we retrofit these cities? I think we need to get rid of all of these glass buildings and high rises. Like Salengar, uh, Nico said, um, let's don't worry. Maybe they will disappear in the next 20 years. But the issue is urbanization is not going to stop. We, and I think uh, the, the, the forecast is that by 2050, we'll have nearly more than 90% of the world's population living in cities. The issue is we keep on building or we construct these um, environments that is depressing. It's really bad for our mental health. So can we bring back this um, really fundamental structures of nature and everything as part of um, um, our, our, our city? Um, and, and yeah, another thing is, um, you, you talk about these little villages, um, it's fantastic. Look at the villages in Italy, Christopher Alexander referred to all those beautiful villages. These people in one village in Italy, I think, um, Alexandros will be more acquainted with that, but there's more than 300, um, people that's over a hundred and odd years in, the, in this small village. I think it's more than 20% of the village because they connect to place. It's structures that evolve, not designed by some smart architect, it's structures that revolves from nature. So really fascinating stuff. And um, yeah, I think <laughs> this panel, it's um, maybe we got the clues yet to change the world and save the planet. <laughs> yes, well, yeah, we certainly have the clues, but I think I'm getting tired uh, Katie wanted to speak, and then uh, Victor <coughs> Sony is waiting, so we should uh, hear uh, from Vikram. Katie, you wanted to say something? Well, I just no, I think I, let, I, let let Vikram come in, huh? Okay, Vikram, can you come in? Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Oh, good. Okay. Well, this is actually a wonderful session. Um, I happen to be a physicist, a theoretical physicist. Hello. Uh, yes. yeah. We can hear you. Okay. And I also happen to be somebody who works on ecological wisdom and have written a book called Naturally. But uh, what I wanted to talk about was that with to in, infuse all this nature and feeling into this thing, we decided to work on a city which would be like a living organism. You know, it would be self-organized. It would be self-sufficient on most things. It could control its own climate, and um, it it would be it would be designed also in such a way. 
and it's called the natural city. And uh, what we tried to do was to make it, you know, maximally self-sufficient. It has a, 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 and 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 self-organized. And it was a city which was one of the designs was like a chessboard, with the white squares being the built-up squares, and and the uh, the other the, the black squares being the green areas of the city, which had pasture, forest, agriculture, everything in, and the water coming from the floodplain of the river which was next to it. Now, all I wanted to say is that, as a matter of fact, we have two examples, the smallest life forms, which you can take from the insects to the bacteria, which, which actually do all the work, and to the largest life form, which is the planet, uh, which, which of course, as somebody said, is part of the whole Gaia, the, the Earth hypothesis. Uh, we found that we could actually work on a city on, on those principles on the, you know, it's a metabolic city. It's a city which is built like an organism. And hearing what you all have been saying, so I don't know, we have something on the net on this, it's called Amravati Natural City. And we have something in the Economic and Political Weekly of India, an article on the natural, but we haven't managed to get it across to people that you're talking about starting from evolution, which is the best place to learn something, you can actually design a city which gives you quality of life uh, for, for, for everybody. And, 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 and includes this, as, as somebody was saying, that you really bring the countryside into the city. You don't have to go out of the city <clears throat> to look at that. And you make it completely self-sufficient. Mm. So I don't know, but I mean, do you, do you think such, such an idea could wash? Well, uh, Vikram, I, I advise you to uh, send the link to the organizers so that that uh, so that your your uh, your paper will be uh, freely available, just like we have sent links to the online course and, and everything else. <clears throat> so I think that's it's a nice uh, it's a nice uh, point to conclude. Um, uh, do our panelists want to make a very brief 10 second concluding statement? so that we can uh, wrap up this excellent session. Everyone is talked out. Oh, well, Katie, you wanted to say something. Thank you. Katie, my, yes. My, com my commentary opens up a whole nother can of worms. Um, it was more cautionary. Can of worms. Oh, can of open worms. the can, can of worms. open <laughs> the can so we can see the worms and then we end on that note. And then people okay, are okay. excited. So I think between what Nir and Philip were saying, it just, it, it brought um, to the forefront the image of um, a, a good intentions gone awry, where there's this trying, um, I'll, I'll divulge what project I'm talking about in a second, but where you're trying to address a problem. So you've brought a problem with you rather than thinking aspirationally, like what do you actually want to experience or like, um, and covered it in this idea of like, it's very sustainable, trying to use terminology and skewing the science to your benefit. And I think that's a trap that people can fall into if they're rushing to, to solve these problems. And so I, I don't know how many of you online are familiar with the um, UC California or the University of California, Santa Barbara, project yeah, that's ca that? captured na that? national national spotlight um i can share my screen quickly and Thanks. show you um but in their desperate um hunt for uh modernity the, no um to, they have a serious problem with um house student housing or lack of st student housing so um when can you can you see this rendering? No, yeah. No? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay. This is this is the proposed approved Munger Hall um, <laughs> at UCSB. And it's it sleeps 4,500 students. And the ironic part about it is actually it's one of the more interesting facades on the campus. Like the architecture of the campus is by and large not biophilic or beautiful. Right. So this is more attractive, but it's way over scale relative to everything else in the community. And those windows that you see are all the 
are majority communal areas. They're not the bedrooms. In oh. fact, none of the bedrooms have windows. No. And it's been likened to a, uh, let's see if I have, an, there's another image down here, maybe. It's, a um, uh, it's worse. It, sorry, I thought I had, I can't flip while I'm sharing screens. I can't flip my um, tabs that I'm on, but um, it's been likened to a prison because it's just row after row after row of bedrooms. And there's one bathroom for every eight beds. Storage, human storage. Right. And then they have a false windows, or sorry, like light panels in each bedroom that oh, are no. supposedly providing circadian lighting. But the concept is, oh, well, you can tune it however you want. And so they're missing the point that there's an actual biological cycle like that we respond to. So they're skewing the science to justify some of their design decisions. And um, the bigger issue is that uh, there's two, only two, I think, you know, e egress okay. here. Like they're not, they don't have to follow code because they're in a special zone. So it's like, it's a real bastardization of what it's everything, of sustainability everything, everything. and yeah, it's being designed it's to like lead to lead gold. It, right. Either. So they're saying, oh, it's super sustainable. We got, you know, we're, we're designed to lead gold. It uses the science, but it's missing the point. They're trying to design for a problem exactly. rather than design for exactly. an experience of the community. Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> thank you, Katie, for showing that because it has valuable lessons for whoever is listening, namely a monstrous building that violates all of biophilia with a fairly nice facade, okay? So something that comrade Joseph Stalin would have loved, an inhuman building prison-like building that has a fairly nice facade. Okay, that, that's, that's sheer deception, sheer deception. And we have to really uh, be, be wary of, of architects, dishonest architects, stealing words and concepts and applying them to inhuman design. But this fortunately- This is not a traditional building by any stretch of the imagination. Exactly, it's but it's, it's, it's good that Katie showed it because if people saw this in the journals, they would say, oh, this is a traditional building. No, it's phony. It's an inhumane building that's pretending to be a traditional building. So Gosh. people who are listening to our webinar, please be careful. Architects are dishonest and they well, will present- uh, Actually, more read. to the point is that, um, that when you have money being thrown at you, in this case, Charlie Munger is donating $200 million, which is only a percentage of the cost, but it's like they're, they're, they're responding to the money rather than recognizing that they're doing a, a social experiment on thousands of kids that could affect them negatively for the rest of their lives. Um, and, you know, so there's, um, you know, they're turning a blind eye to something just because they can and it, so it, it's it fails across yeah. all you know I, the, these kind of things i i actually prefer to um ignore them because uh, there's no good in it the the facade is not generally traditional Tr real traditional design almost never uses square windows never uses squares as a matter of fact because they're such important shapes you have to actually be architecturally literate to have a conversation about architecture. And if, unless we are architecturally literate, the first thing we teach at the Institute is architectural literacy. So you know how to discuss these things. The whole classical method in all the world is humanistic, it's human oriented. Nobody would put their children in these cells. What kind of people are these? So I'm sorry, this is inhumane and really not smart. A yeah. way of doing things. Unfortunately, I don't know how it got that this far, other than it was promoted by people who are architecturally illiterate. So I have you, no idea how this ever happened. Yeah, no, okay, that yeah. is crazy. And Katie, I saw that floor plan. If you look at that, that looks exactly like torture chambers in the mm. Second World War. I'm, maybe I can even be so worse than say it looks like gas chambers to me. Um, well, gas and chambers were more functional. Yeah, 
but this is like um, and and this is this is this is the issues that we face going into a new modern world where um, grasping at straws because we're facing bigger issues than that and um, I mean and this is not acceptable it's not humane we we cannot allow this and I think we mustn't ignore these things. We must address it and we must stand up. And this is where a new worldview needs to be raised with, with, with everyone. And, and there must be a sincere move to, to, to address these issues. Because it's just like you say, the future of those children that's going to be in there will have serious psychological problems. Um, and, and, and I mean, mm -hmm. there's not much time left, but I'm, but I'm doing quite a bit of work in restorative environments, design, look at um, and how we deal in with, with mental health facilities. And it's the similar issue. If you look at our mental health facilities across the world, it's like institutes. It's not places for people to heal. Why do we get to a stage to get so that people land up into mental health facilities because of their environment that they currently live in is the issue. Let's address the problem right at the root. And that is exactly what you just showed now. We need to avoid it and make a change that this, this can't go ahead. And I know well, I, I sound a very optimistic or maybe... Um, but this, we need, you know, like You're the right. French Revolution didn't start um, big and moved. And if that could have happened, all of these changes, the Eastern Berlin Wall came down and so forth. As we need to, we need to stand up and make a change because this is un unacceptable what happened in the world due to architects, planners, the built environment, the total move the, or current situation. That's not, um, yeah, it's not good. Okay, th thank you, Philip. I call on Kirti to turn off, push the off switch <laughs> to conclude our wonderful panel. Sir, here, here. you are on mute. We cannot hear you. Kirti, sir, you are on mute. Can you hear me now? Yes. 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 Uh, f there is only one word, Nikos, uh, fascinating. I don't really think it could it could get better in terms of wisdom, in terms of analysis, in terms of ideas. And believe me, someone called me just now to say who was listening, this is almost a spiritual experience listening to this one. I think you, know, so you couldn't you couldn't say it better. So I'm I'm absolutely thrilled that we did this. Uh, let me let me thank you profusely and from the bottom of my heart for this incredibly rich, incredibly, I think, educating, highly educating experience that you provided us. And Nikos, thank you very much for putting this together. Mm -hmm. Nikos, thank you very much for accepting what appeared to me a very casual request, but you just you took it and took it so well. And uh, let me kind of thank you uh, for organizing, for pursuing, for I think, you know, seeing that, you know, small little problem that came up essentially was solved. And uh, we had a fascinating experience. Let me thank everyone in this incredibly rich panel uh, for the presence, for the contribution, for the ideas. So thank you, Alexander. So thank you, Philip. Thank you, Ann. Thank you, Katie. Thank you, Neil. And of course, thank you, our own Prem Chandavakar. Fascinating, Prem. Uh, wonderful to, to hear you this. Uh, uh, I, I also want to thank uh, Anand Bhatt, uh, colleague at uh, Architecture Ace, who was very helpful in terms of you know, getting this you know, message across. And as uh, Nikos pointed out, I think, you know, in terms of uh, uh, spreading the message, you know, uh, and, and education and the literature that is available. Uh, let me also tell everyone who's here that this is just the first phase. This is, we have two uh, uh, webinars. The camera. Uh, this particular webinar is... Uh, First, uh, two. Second one is taking place on 24th. It's an equally exciting.
learned panel exactly at the same time we come and participate uh, let me kind of tell you this that you know i personally have been trying to kind of uh, intuitively saying this for 50 years and today i have found many more words and languages and people who essentially i think you know saying and doing it so thank you very much uh, mm -hmm. uh, and of course let me thank my colleague uh, uh, ankisha who has made this possible and who is behind the scene uh, mm -hmm. making this possible every day so thank you very much mm -hmm. and please make yourselves available on 24th again for the second session uh, it's going to be equally exciting uh, uh, and we have a fascinating uh, panel there to thank you again uh, for a very long session uh, for your commitment for your enthusiasm for your uh, engagement thank you very much for everyone Thank you.